All right, I think everybody that's going to be here is here. If not, they could uh, be a little bit late, but we'll go ahead and get started and we'll take up some prayer requests. So welcome all of our brothers in Uganda. Let's take up some prayer requests. Intercession prayer for, for witness. Amen. Amen. All right, Miss Kina is going to have the opportunity to share Jesus with her family. Uh, most are not believers, so we'll pray for the Holy Spirit to go before her and for her witness to be strong and powerful and have results. So that's an incredible thing. It's a it's a wonderful opportunity, though. You have to look at it as an opportunity. So what else? Yes, sir. Uh, my wife and I have uh, friends that other meetings. We're hoping he's kind of getting there, but he's not there yet. Uh, but she's also facing some uh, health issues uh, with pregnancy. I think it's probably stress related. She was supposed to go have an appointment uh, sometime coming this week to, to see if she's losing the baby or mm. if it's going to be. Requirements of that list or whatever. So okay. And this is your wife's thing? Uh, well, I mean, we're mutually friends with them. You and you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, mainly praying for this baby and for y'all to have opportunity to keep nurturing. Keep nurturing the uh, husband's. Uh, okay. No, so we, they had actually agreed to go to church uh, this past Sunday, uh, but then she was uh, having some bleeding and everything. And mm. they kind of postponed okay. and said, we'll, we'll try to. All right. What else? Pray for our uh, our our uh, prayer walk we're doing tomorrow for, at the apartment right. complex. So we are uh, targeting some targeting. And my wife doesn't like that word, but I don't know another word. But we have an apartment complex right around the corner from our house, and we've been praying. As a matter of fact, Will and I are going to be fasting uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. And we're going to go prayer walk that apartment complex uh, and pray for a person of peace to open uh, their apartment to us. And we'll start a group in there and begin to try to reach the apartment complex. We're going to try to do three apartment complexes like that. And so we're hoping to, uh, one of the things I want to do is uh, a young lady that I know is doing a ministry uh, where they're reaching into apartment complexes. And she had a great idea for a baptistry. It's a blow up pool that you can carry around in a little box about like this. And we've been using the big metal trough. But that thing's hard to lug around and tug around, you know, when you're going to an apartment complex or something. They just use a blow-up pool. Uh, when they're going to baptize someone, they invite everybody in the apartment complex to come out and watch. And then they baptize them right there in the apartment complex. And so that we're looking at some ministry like that. So we're praying for a person of peace is what the scriptures call it. We're, we're looking for a person of peace. What else? All right. Well, let's pray for these things and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for today. It's been a beautiful day, Lord. We know that you are here with us. And I just pray, Lord, that you uh, that your spirit would just take away any distractions, take away uh, the stress of this day, that we could focus on what you would have for us at night. Lord, I do pray uh, for Miss Tina as you have given her an absolutely incredible opportunity. And I pray, Lord, that you take her anxiety away. I just pray that uh, her own testimony would just flow as natural as it could be from her lips, that you would go before her even now, that your spirit uh, would go before her and begin to prepare the hearts of her family members, that they would receive her witness. Uh, and Lord, I pray uh, just against the whispers, the schemes of the devil, all the things that he would be trying to thwart at this moment. Uh, I, I just pray against that in the name of Jesus that you would prepare uh, their hearts for her witness. And Lord, I pray uh, uh, for a brother's friend and, and the, the wife and the husband, both Lord, the husband especially who doesn't know you. Lord, I just pray uh, that you would remove all the barriers that would keep them from coming to church and knowing you. And Lord, I pray for this little one. I just pray that uh, 
you would uh, touch this young lady and help uh, this this baby to grow and, and be healthy and come into this world uh, just like all other babies. But Lord, just intervene in this situation and bring healing to her body and uh, just allow uh, Brother Jason to be able to witness and his, his wife as well and uh, just pray for your intervention, Lord, that your spirit would begin to work on their hearts. And Lord, we do pray for a person of peace in this apartment complex. I just pray that you would open a door, uh, that we would be allowed to go in and start a community group and just see the power of your spirit work uh, in this apartment complex. And Lord, also to show us the other two that we would be reaching into. Lord, I thank you for being here with us tonight. I just pray that you, uh, your presence would be strong and that we would learn how to be better uh, Christians, how to be better church planters, and just have your way with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are several things we're going to talk about tonight. This one is uh, for, going to focus a little bit on those who are familiar with the more traditional structure of church, uh, the, the programs that are set up in traditional church, and how that differs from what we actually see in discipleship in the scriptures. And so uh, I, I titled this Structured Program to discipleship. And so we're going to talk about the way Jesus discipled. I think that it's very important uh, that we look at Jesus as our model for so many things. And um, the way he did discipleship was incredible. And so that's what we're going to look at first before we go into actually developing or establishing a discipleship strategy in our churches. Uh, one thing I will say is, uh, I've been in ministry over 20 years. The only church that I have been into, uh, Catherine and I have been a part of five churches, not counting the one we're in now. And the only one of those five churches that had a discipleship program in it, if you, for lack of a better word, program, uh, at our church, we call it the discipleship path. Um, the only one that had it is the church I pastored. And it didn't have it when I got there. It, uh, it took me three years to establish it and to get it going. And so none of the churches that we have been in had any type of discipleship uh, classes or pathway in it. Um, I've also been in the association for now over 10 years. And I would say that 95 plus percent of our churches have no discipleship uh, path in them at all. And that, that would probably be a conservative number. It's probably higher than that. It's probably more like 99% of our churches do not have uh, an uh, evangelism. Will you give Brother Archer one of those? Uh, real? They do not have an intentional discipleship strategy. So let's look at, at the, the people that Jesus taught here. Jesus taught the multitudes. We see in this passage in, in Mark 6, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. In Luke 5, it says he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, asked him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. And if you look at the context of those two passages, uh, it, in in it uses the word multitude of people in several of those uh, before and after passages. And when I think of a multitude, I don't think about 10 or 15 people or even 
20 or 30 people, when you think of a multitude, you're probably thinking of several hundred people. And so Jesus definitely did teaching to the multitudes. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount was another. Now, people will argue that Jesus called his disciples to himself. He was speaking to the 12. He sat down on the mountain. But there's no doubt that the scriptures indicate that they were surrounded by a multitude of people who were listening to Jesus as he taught. Then uh, Jesus taught large groups of people. So we're notching it down. <clears throat> Multitudes is like hundreds of people. It's like what you'd see in one of our larger churches. But it said that Jesus also ta taught uh, large groups of people in Zacchaeus' house. If we read that story, there were uh, quite a few people in that house that night. In Matthew's house, uh, it said that there were many tax collectors and uh, Pharisees around, plus the people that Matthew had invited, plus the disciples were there. It's a pretty large group. Uh, Simon the leper's house, another time where Jesus went into a person's house and there was a, a significantly large group. And then the house where the man was lowered through the roof, it said that there were so many people that Jesus, uh, I mean, that the, the, the gentleman carrying the man on the pallet, that they couldn't even get in the door. That's why they went up on the roof. So that would indicate a pretty large group, and Jesus was in the midst of them teaching. Then we see, uh, go from a large group to a small group, the 12. Matthew 11, 1, Jesus teaches and instructs on preaching and teaching to his 12 disciples. Hey, Ralph. Uh, John 13, Jesus teaches them humility and service, you know, in that upper room experience. And then in Luke 11, 1, they said, Lord, Teach us to pray. Jesus uses that opportunity uh, to teach them as well. You go uh, a little further down, Jesus teaches an inner group. If you'll remember several times, come on in, brother. Several times Jesus taught uh, just that inner three, Peter, James, and John. In Luke 9, 28 through 29, he teaches them to pray. Matthew 26, uh, 36 and 46. He's teaching them to pray and to persevere. So we see that we've gone from literally multitudes of people uh, that Jesus is teaching, and now we're down to an inner three. Well, Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus disciples one-on-one. -on -one. A uh, couple of times we see with Peter, I gave a reference there in John 21, but uh, multiple times, especially with Peter, it seemed like Jesus singled him out uh, to teach him some specific lessons. And then uh, in Luke chapter 10, at the house in Capernaum where Lazarus lived, uh, Mary sat at Jesus' feet alone, and Jesus uh, taught her one-on-one. -on -one. Now, that would have been a one-on-two -on -two if Martha hadn't have been so preoccupied, as Jesus said. Uh, but Mary sat at Jesus' feet, intently listening. So we see different levels of discipleship. And so one thing we're going to talk about tonight is what it means to personally make disciples, and then what it means to create a discipleship atmosphere in a church where you have intentional uh, classes that will help people become more like Christ. And so there is a personal uh, responsibility for making disciples, and there is a corporate responsibility for making disciples. And I would say that the church in our day and age in America has failed at both. Failed at personally making disciples, which is the Great Commission, go therefore into the world and make disciples. <clears throat> and you skip down, it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's what discipleship is, is, is teaching people what Jesus taught. Uh, and then corporately, having something that takes someone from, an, from a non-believer to a committed follower for Christ. So we'll get into that a little bit deeper. So Matthew 28, that's what I was just talking about, 16 through 18. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Uh, go, therefore, and make disciples. Uh, go therefore into all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. So that's the, the context of that passage. 
So let's talk about this for a little bit. There's, I put 10 things down here, uh, list some characteristics of personally making disciples. What's that look like? It takes patience. Patience, all right, that's good. Yeah. That, that, that's a great, a great one, put it down. Accountability. Accountability, that's an excellent one, an excellent one. Patience, accountability, what else? Knowledge of the scripture. Knowledge of the scripture, that's good. What was the one Will said? What Knowing the word, he said uh, accountability. What else? Uh, the, 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 the discipline. Discipline, great. What else? That's the discipleship and discipline have the same root. Whoa. <clears throat> Love. Love. Amen. Obedience. Obedience. Yeah, what did Jesus say? Teaching them to obey. Obedience. What else? Dedication. Godly fear. fear. What's that? Godly fear. <laughs> yeah, if I don't do this, what's going to happen? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> what else? Perseverance. Perseverance. That's that's a good one. And there's no right or wrong. I'm just trying to make you guys think about what it means to to disciple. What is discipleship? Well, like? had ten already wrote. Like, man, we're hitting every single one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we could probably list thirty or forty Correct. things here. Divine uh, uh, direction. Divine direction. The the Holy Spirit ought to be involved. God's word ought to be involved. Which uh, Ronnie said that. Uh, I would say that accountability is a definite one. That's part of what discipleship is about, being accountable to someone for your walk. How about walking the walk, right? You got, you got to live it. Uh, our mission statement uh, in as simple form as you can get it is living and sharing the transformed life. You can't share what you're not living, right? So living it. What else? Spiritual vision. Spiritual vision. Yeah, there has to be a spiritual direction yeah. to it. That's what it's. People shall fail, right? Yeah. Which would be the the Holy Spirit involvement in it. So those are some excellent answers. Excellent answers. We could probably list more than ten. I just wanted us to begin to think about you know what is being accomplished in a discipleship relationship. What about a relationship? Mm -hmm. that's how jesus got to know those disciples that's how they got to know him uh part of our discipleship is knowing the word where do we first learn about jesus if he's who we need to be like where's the best place to go to learn to be like jesus the word it has to be word centered discipleship is about being word centered so uh as jesus taught he didn't just teach like we're teaching right now, academically, like from, uh, he wasn't always behind the pulpit, right? Uh, practicality is something that's very important in discipleship. Uh, Will and I, tomorrow at about 4.30, uh, Will's going to go with me, and we are going to go physically, practically, prayer walk. And what are we doing to prepare for that? We're already praying for the activity to happen. We're praying for the Holy Spirit to go before us and we're fasting. So there's a practical application to our spirituality here. And that's what we need, especially those of you who are leaders. If you want to teach your people to do something, you can't always preach it from the pulpit. You need to be taking people with you and showing them what that looks like. When we did Life Share Galveston, that was the, the heart of that training was we taught in the classroom setting just like this. And then in the evening time, we went down on the beach and we literally practiced what we taught. We would let them watch us do it. And then what we were talking about earlier, sharing our personal testimony and then using some form of evangelism tool to present the gospel. And then we'd say, OK, see that family right there? You're next. And of course, some of the people were like, what? You expect me to really do this? You know, they came to a training, but they didn't expect to really do anything. That's an area we lack, the practicality part. So discipleship needs to have 
So let's go do this together. It's about walking uh, through this journey called our faith together. Yes, sir. Another one that kind of coincides with a lot of them, but humility. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, one of the things that we always have to remember is no matter how far along you are on your walk, you can learn from someone you're pouring into, right? And so uh, always being humble. Uh, so those are, those are great answers. And like I said, we, I could have put 20 blanks on that page, but I'm trying to get us to begin to think about what discipleship looks like because if 90% of the churches that I've been in doesn't have a discipleship uh, pathway, most likely the one you're in right now doesn't have a disciple pathway. Uh, on that note, how many of you, and I've asked this to the, to the classes before, how many of you are in a church right now that actually has an intentional discipleship pathway that can take someone from an unchurched person to a committed follower of Christ? It's an actual intentional plan. How many of you have that in your church right now? Well, I kind of, you're going to argue with me a little bit on that one, but I think that's what Celebrate Recovery is, the biggest discipleship program out there, but. But what if you're not a drug addict? What if nobody turns you on to celebrate recovery? Drug addict, that has something to do or, with drugs. Okay, uh, habits, hurts, and hangups. What if no one has, because I'm familiar uh, with Now it. you're falling into the CR question, right? Because there's not a Christian out there that doesn't have a hurt, hangup, or habit. What if they're not going to? That's what I'm, that's my point. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, well, their right. discipleship program intentionally, you didn't say they have to come or, right. you know. Right, That's a program to me of discipleship. But. <laughs> yeah. But most of the churches that I've been in, and I almost dare to say all of them, do not have a plan for taking someone from unchurched, unbelieving, to being a committed follower of Christ. This is where we're failing in the church today. Jesus told us to go make disciples, and it's not being done on an individual basis, and it's not being done on a corporate basis. So that's what we're going to learn tonight is... We need to know what discipleship is. We need to understand what's going on in a discipleship relationship, and we need to see the multi-levels of discipleship. Right now, uh, I do. I spend some time, I'm, I don't know that I spend a lot, but I spend some time pouring into ministers in a discipleship relationship. I meet with the same guys there. I met with one today. Uh, for a couple of hours. I met with one Friday, and I meet with this, them every week. It's a week-to-week -week basis, and so uh, a lot of my discipleship is with other ministers, um, but I have discipled, you know, just laymen as well, people that I led to Christ and baptized and, and got them uh, plugged into church and got them in discipleship uh, pathway, and so we all need to be playing our part in that role at some point. So let's go a little further. It says, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. In Luke 11, 1, they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus did teach them to pray in Luke 11, 1, and he gave them, some people call it, excuse me, the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the model prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17. But the model prayer that he gave them, some principles to understand, and I'm not going to break down that, that prayer, but, but he gave them this model prayer that, that showed them what prayer should look like. But then Jesus demonstrated prayer to them, and I could have listed a ton of scriptures here where Jesus went out all night on the mountain and prayed. He showed them what prayer looked like. I gave some examples there, the, the John 17, which is Jesus' high priestly prayer. Uh, there was one time when he only took, or a couple of times actually, when he only took Peter, James, and John. There were times when he had all 12 with him when he prayed. But there were times when he took Peter, James, and John aside, and he prayed with them. And guess what? There were times when he said, sorry, guys, and he went up on the mountain alone. But he modeled it. He didn't just tell them, you need a dynamic prayer life. He showed them what a dynamic prayer life looks like. Amen. And so if we expect our people to be good witnesses, they need to see us being good witnesses. And what I mean by that is sharing our faith. Uh, I have church members in my church right now that have been with me when I shared the gospel. They need to see you doing it, especially if you're a pastor 
uh, a minister or any leadership position. You got to be modeling it. Jesus taught his disciples to share the gospel. They took him into Zacchaeus' house. You remember the story? If I have uh, ripped off, this is the modern version, if I've ripped off any one Lord, I'll pay him back four times the amount. And what did Jesus say? Surely salvation has come to this house. We see it in uh, Matthew's house, uh, uh, who, who was formerly Levi. Uh, Jesus goes into his house, and the gospel is shared. The demoniac, they were with him when Jesus went across the, the lake uh, in the boat, and he heals this man demon-possessed. And then the scriptures say he basically gets back in the boat and leaves and tells that guy to go tell everybody in Damascus what he's doing for him. Yeah, the one with the pig. Right. <laughs> and so Jesus shows them what witnessing looks like. The woman at the well. <laughs> the woman at the well. You know, they come back and they're like, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. And, you know, and they're kind of being judgmental. And, and yet a whole city gets led to Christ because of her uh, uh, encounter with Jesus. So he demonstrated it. He sent his disciples out. He not only showed them what to do. Uh, I just preached a message on Luke 10 uh, this past Sunday, but he took 70 of them, not just not the apostles, but 70 average lay people. And he sent them out by twos. And what did it say they did? They, they looked for a person of peace, said they stayed in that house, and then they began to share with everybody around them. Uh, one of my points to my message this past Sunday was Jesus started church planting before the day of Pentecost ever happened. That's why on the day of Pentecost, they knew what to do. Jesus already sent them out, said, stay in this house. It's a headquarters for ministry. They started sharing the gospel. Jesus showed them the house church movement before the day of Pentecost ever happened, right? right. So he demonstrates it, and then he sends them out to practice. It. And then they come back and give a report. What was their report? Man, demons even were subject to us in your name. You know, great things happen when he sent them out. Uh, Jesus taught his discipleship service by teaching and preaching and healing in their presence. Uh, he washed the disciples' feet. So we see Jesus teaching them, but then he demonstrated it. They came up and said, Lord, you got to send all these people home. They got nothing to eat. They've been out here all day. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat, right? But he has them sit down in groups on the ground. And then he, he says, what do we have? A few fish and bread. And he multiplies it and he feeds them. But he demonstrates uh, service to them. And then one of my favorite stories of all is Jesus is on the shore. And the disciples are out in the boat. And uh, John looks and says, it's the Lord. And Peter dives off the boat. Nothing but his loin club. Dives off the boat. Gets there. And what's Jesus doing? cooking breakfast. Jesus cooked them breakfast. Yeah. He demonstrated service. And they, I don't know if they had thick bacon, brother, but they did have thick fish. So <laughs> that's barbecue for sure. Right? Yeah. You know, in all of these things, I see the difference between learned knowledge and experiential wisdom is application. Application, right. And that, that's what I'm saying. And most of our people, and you who are going to be preaching, pay attention to this. You can't just tell your people, well, you need a prayer life. You need to have prayer and devotion. My answer always to that was, well, I came to know Jesus from a non-believing background. I was a grown man. I didn't know what prayer and devotion was. I didn't know what quiet time was. I still don't know what quiet time is. No, I, don't know I talked to the Lord out loud. I found <laughs> out that you don't always have to be quiet to communicate with the Lord. Uh, you can have out loud time with the Lord. I pray just like I'm talking to you right now. That's how I talk to the Lord. Sometimes people hear me and think I'm crazy, but that's okay. Right. In devotion, I said before Jesus came into my life, I've been, I was never devoted to anything, nothing. So when a preacher is preaching, you need to have a quiet time in devotion. That meant nothing to me. What does that mean? So we have to demonstrate it. We have to show people. We have to get them to, we can't just assume that they understand what that means. So Jesus did the practical application this Brother Archer was talking about. So I know that was like a fire hydrant there, but I wanted us to see that Jesus as the great master teacher 
didn't just tell the disciples to go out and make disciples. He spent three years showing them what discipleship looked like. And there were times when he discipled many. There were times when he discipled a large crowd. There was times when he discipled only the three. And a few occasions, he was one-on-one -on -one with someone. Peter really needed to hear, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Who? Why did he Somebody need to hear up. that, right? Because he was going to deny Jesus. And so Jesus gave him that wonderful lesson one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so we see discipleship in those levels. So I want to go to the page that says uh, steps to take. Jesus' pattern of discipleship making can be boiled down to three basic steps. Selection, instruction, and then apprenticeship. How did Jesus select the disciples? Does anybody know? Do you remember? It's by the glory of the Holy Spirit revealing who and what and where. Yeah, but how did it happen? They say you just walk around and call them to come follow me. What happened just before that? It's very important. It said that Jesus went up on the mountain all night long and prayed. All night long, he went into prayer. And it said when he came down off that mountain, he chose his disciples. And so there's a lesson right there. You're going to pick some leaders in your church? You might ought to go pray and fast. Pray up. That's right. He all night long, he basically did an all night prayer vigil. And yet so many times we go, oh, She's a school teacher in the public school. Oh, get her over there in that Sunday school class. She's got to have the gift of teaching. That don't mean she's got the gift of teaching. But we go put her in there. Instead, we need to pray. Jesus modeled what it should look like, right? So selection is hard to do. Selection is the first thing. It's hard to do. You know why? Because our culture teaches us to be democratic and treat everyone equally. Well, do you know what? We are not all equal. And it's time somebody begins to say, we're not all equal. Now, we're equally loved. We're equally sinners before a living God. But you don't have my gifts. I don't have your gifts. And so everybody's not at the same place spiritually. We can't treat everyone the same. Some people can handle very direct to the point. Other people need to be nurtured. And we need to select. And how do we do that? Be a good thing to pray, wouldn't it? Amen. And so when we talk about discipleship, uh, I talked to our group about it. And I said, especially if you're the older person, it would be better for you to have someone come to you than you go to them. Because then they chose you to pour into their life. And I'll, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And Later on in our classes, we will have a section on uh, coaching and mentoring as well, which is all part of discipleship. So um, if we're going to do any disciple making at all, we must select a few and consecrate our efforts on these. This was Paul's command to disciple uh, that he gave to Timothy. He said in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the, the things you have heard me say, in other words, I've been pouring into you. Paul had been discipling Timothy. He said, the things you have heard me say, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So how many levels of discipleship are there? How many levels are there? Three. Four. Paul pouring into Timothy. Timothy pouring into men who would be qualified to teach other men. So you see, so Paul didn't take all of them on himself. Paul took on a few. Like I told you, I, I have uh, some discipleship time with other ministers. Uh, I don't disciple everyone they are pouring into. I focus on them and they pour into others. And so you select a few. Paul advised Timothy not to try to reach everyone himself, but to select those who could multiply his teaching ministry. And so uh, for one thing is if you try to do it all yourself, you're limited anyway. Uh, you pour into four or five men and then let them pour into four or five men. Or if it's in the case of Tina, she'll pour into uh, several young ladies who will be able to pour into several other young ladies. Uh, 
the uh, of the model for the metabolic activity that was the loss to be saved, the saved to be discipled, the, the disciple to be matured, and the mature to be multiplied. Amen. Amen. That's great. And and you don't always have to be mature to multiply. It doesn't have to be in that order, but that's definitely a yeah, great body young kids have babies. <laughs> right. But that is, but see, that is a, an intentional model. Now I don't know how they teach that, but the the structure of what you're talking about is a great uh model. Yes, yeah, so, uh, um, when we talk about prayer and this uh go into your closet model, mm -hmm. um Martin Buber, you're familiar with Martin mm -hmm. Buber, a great theologian who said there's a place of stillness. A place of stillness surrounded by silence in the depths of the heart of any person. That place is where God works. The intersection. Yep. Yep. And so selection is, is the key uh, to be able to pour into other people, pour into other men. Uh, if you're a leader in your church and you have uh, young ministers that are in your church, that's a good place to start with with you so um and then instruction or teaching is carried on both verbally and non-verbally once we have selected uh one or a few uh individuals to disciple we must personally discuss biblical truths with them and then personally demonstrate how these truths work uh, in and out of our life and ministry so discussion without demonstration is too theoretical demonstration without discussion loses much of its precision and is easily misinterpreted so both discussion and demonstration require planning if we plan both regular meetings and real life experiences we will have plenty of opportunity for both discussion and demonstration so this is what i was talking about i taught this past sunday on uh seeking persons of peace and entering into their home and and using that as a place of ministry and yet uh, Will and I are praying and fasting, praying for the Holy Spirit to go before us. Tomorrow we'll start prayer walking the apartment complex and we're looking for a person of peace. So you teach it from the pulpit or your Sunday school class or your small group, but at some point you got to show them what it looks like. That's the other area we lack so much in church is the practical application. What does that look like, preacher? That was a great sermon, but what does it look like, preacher? That's what we've got to do better as pastors and preachers and teachers. Is it's one thing to tell somebody how to do something, but whenever you say, "Come on, and I'll show you what that looks like," right. man, it makes it a whole lot easier. A whole lot easier. So, how do you get by the fact that the problem that you're talking about is because people already think that it's the pastor's job? Because I when I got in, that's what I thought too. I said, well, that's a job. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that so is how do you get by that? Because if you're gonna show them that you're gonna do it, mm -hmm. then how are you gonna bypass that thinking that says, okay, he's doing it, I'll have to go out there. You have to teach him it. Well, just like Will, Will is praying and fasting with me. He's <laughs> going tomorrow. He's and yeah, he is. And that's the reason why I'm seeking him right. to be a part of this new church thing, because he don't have that traditional baggage. And that is a hard thing to overcome. It's a very hard thing to overcome. Uh, the, the conversation we had uh, previously about who's the evangelist in the church, the one teaching all of y'all how to go out and share your faith. But if you ask the average church member, they're going to say, well, that's that guy over there. He don't ever shut up about Jesus. Well, it ought to be you too. Because you've got a testimony and Jesus commanded you to go do it. And so uh, in my sermon Sunday, I, I point blank told them there is, uh, Jesus said the, the, uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Right. One of my points was, is that every single Christian is a laborer and every laborer is sent out, every one. And the funny thing about Jesus, he tells them, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. So they pray. And then Jesus says, your prayer is answered. Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> Jesus is a funny guy, right? Sure. But that's the truth of the matter is that uh, I think it's easier to convince people of the truth than it is to get them to do it. Right. Yeah. But if we're modeling it and we're fake, all I can be is accountable for me. And we're going to model it and we're going to hope that some of our other 
uh, folks come on board. Our other community groups are going to be praying for their neighbors. You know, <clears throat> we're already talking about making cookies and going and knocking on their doors. But the leader of that group is going to show them how it's done. So uh, that's the reason I believe that some people aren't really attracted to our model mm -hmm. because we're going to try to, to, to put it into practice. And like I said, when we did life share and we partnered with churches on that end, every time we said we were going to do something they didn't want to do, one lady literally said, my dog hasn't had her rabies shot in 10 years. I've got to get her to the vet. I was like, what's another hour, right? right? It was just an excuse to not participate because we were going to go on the beach and witness, right? So you're always going to have those people because the church is has allowed that mentality for a long time. Right. But I mean, you got Christ who says he gave gifts to the church. Mm -hmm. Give apostles, evangelists, teachers, mm -hmm. pastors. Mm -hmm. So where are they at? I, I believe that they're there. I just yeah. believe that, you know. Uh, yeah, but he gave those gifts mm -hmm. the equipping of the saints. Right. Yeah, they got to do the, the work of the report. Right. To do the work of the You're exactly well, right. That's the key. Be these people. Well, it, hopefully it's going to be you and Tina and well, me. That's and what I'm saying. Right. Already, we, we know that's our job already. Right. So how are we going to convince them that they need to be the model. an apostle, that they need to be an evangelist, that they need to be a pastor too? Well, well they, do you know what else Paul yeah, told Timothy though? Whether Timothy was gifted in teaching evangelism, Paul told him, do the work of an evangelist. You're going to, if you're going to plant, you're going to have to think, I've got to show them how to witness and lead people to Christ. Uh, I have put in this class right now, tools in everybody's hands who's come here but i can't make you go out and use them you know just like tonight uh the back of those new testaments have the plan of salvation and nothing is more powerful than your testimony because they can't refute it you know what happened to you. and if you're really living it they can't refute it because they know who you used to be and so between that and leading them through the word of god and you've already prayed up and, and we'll be praying for you, too. We'll be praying for the Holy Spirit to go before you. We have to believe that there's power in the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It's supernatural. That's something we've got to get back to uh, being able to grasp is the fact that we can't always figure it out. Um, if it was left up to the world to be saved because of Carl's wisdom and knowledge, everybody's going to hell. But because I've got the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's Word, and I'm willing to be obedient, God can do some great things through that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've got to be willing to convince people is that he can use you. We can let him use you. That's the harder thing to convince. Yeah. But it's a lot easier if you tell somebody to do something and then say, come on, I'll show you how. And you go with them. And then they get out there and knock on the door and they're received well. And they go, Wow, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was because we had that happen many times. Most gifts are discovered by application. People don't realize mm -hmm. they're gifted until after they go do something and then go, wow. Yeah, I didn't even know I could do that. Yes. So apprenticeship is the next one. Instruction is good. I gave y'all uh, my disciple, my uh, evangelism model, how to share your personal testimony in three minutes. Some of you actually practiced it. Uh, Ronnie told me today that this week, He's had opportunity two or three times, two times to share his personal testimony. He said that one of them was a Christian, but he shared anyway so he could practice. Yeah. What a great way to practice. You find out somebody's already a Christian, so you might not walk them through the Roman road or whatever you want to use, but you can say, hey, tell me your story. I'll tell you mine. And you get some practice there. The other one wasn't a Christian, and it probably didn't go the way you wish it would, but you've got to share with this lady. And the bottom line is this, you're not in control of the results, only the obedience to share. That, that takes a lot of the pressure off when you know it's the Holy Spirit Amen. that does the final. Yeah. So the last part is apprenticeship. You need to se selection, instruction, and then apprenticeship is personally supervised practice. Personally supervised practice. Amen. No single schedule of assignments can be devised for all people. Instead, learning opportunities must be personally devised so that they include plenty of success experiences 
and so that they require progressively more maturity and skill. Apprenticeship should be thought of not so much as a testing device, but as a teaching device. Such an apprenticeship should lead the individual to have confidence uh, that the Lord can work through him to minister to others. So I had a young man who was apprenticing under me in, in the previous church I was in. He wanted to be a pastor. And I've, I've shared with you some stories about him in the past, but he needed preaching experience. And I started letting him preach on Sunday evenings. And in the beginning, it was rough. It was really rough. And I had a couple of people come to me and say, Pastor, I can't listen to him. And I said, yes, you will. Yeah. Because he needs encouragement right now. He needs to be built up right now. So you're going to listen to him. And I'm going to be working with him on the side with positive criticism, helping him to be better. Before he left our church, matter of fact, the reason he was called out of our church is because he went to do pulpit supply in a church that was in an interim. They didn't have a pastor. And he went out to preach and he came back and he goes, you're never going to guess what they, they asked me. And I said, they asked you to come back and preach again. He said, yeah. So he went and preached again. And then he came back and he said, you're not going to believe what they asked me. I said, they asked you to be interim. He said, how did you know? I said, because you're a good preacher. All they heard was him preach. They don't know nothing about him. And I said, and don't be surprised if within the next six months, they don't ask you to be the pastor. It was less than 90 days. Wow. Less than 90 days. He comes up to me. They asked me to be their pastor. What am I going to do? I said, you're going to pray. And you're going to get an answer from God. And then you're going to tell them. He's like, well, what do I do? I said, I'm not God. <laughs> you're, going to have, you're going to talk to the, yeah. to, to, the, to the Lord about it. And I'm going to encourage you either way. And he went to be the pastor. So, but the thing was, is that he needed to, to break his teeth in. A lot of pastors, when I be, first became a pastor at the church I was at, I had very little preaching experience. The first church I was in, I was a, a youth pastor with a desire to pastor. And I was in that church almost four years and I preached twice. Hmm. And that's sad. You know why? Because they had the attitude, that's who, that's what we hired to pastor for. And in, in my previous pastorate, that's what they told me. We didn't hire him to be the, the preacher. We hired you. And I said, no, you didn't. You hired me to be the pastor. They had good bacon. And, but they had good bacon. That's right. <laughs> and we got a pastor now, by the way. So, but we had a great celebration sending him off because they allowed him practical application. He needed somebody to practice on, right? Uh, so we've got to set up uh, situations where we can teach people with practical application. Discover and develop skills. Right. And so this was the way Jesus did it with those apostles. In three years, he trained 11 men to turn the world upside down. And they did. And that's an incredible thing. So those are, uh, oh yeah, one more picture. A contrast. I want us to look, and not all of your churches may be like this, but most of the ones in my experience will look like the column on the left very structured programmatic way of what they call discipleship and then on the right hand side will be jesus's uh example of discipleship so in the structured uh pattern we have uh one shot or weekly or monthly so we're talking about wednesday night bible study we're talking about sunday morning sunday school we're talking about a once a month men's gathering or whatever you want to call it in the structured program, uh, it's 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 usually a one shot deal, and the, uh, as far as time goes, it's it's very regimented. It's going to be you know Wednesday Bible study. If it's at six o'clock, it don't change next week. It's at six o'clock. Sunday school is the same way. Nine thirty is what most of them are. Very structured in disciple making. It's extended and conditional. It may be, hey, will. Uh, let's pray and fast and go prayer walk an apartment complex tomorrow at 4 30. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's very conditional, right? It's and it's very specific towards something that we're learning to do together with making disciples, with reaching uh, this apartment complex. The number. I've seen Sunday school classes. Uh, we've got a class that's meeting in this room on Wednesday that's got about 40 people in. 
uh, the, the church that I previously pastored, we had one Sunday school class that had 40 plus people in it. That's a small church. Some of you have come out of churches that weren't much bigger than that, right? And so, right. Uh, but with Jesus' disciple making, most of the time he was with a small group of people, usually the 12 or less. So uh, the number is usually smaller in, in actual disciple making. And then selectivity in your structured program, in your Sunday morning worship service, in your Sunday school, in your Wednesday night, it's open to everybody. It's open to everybody. In disciple making, it's selective. In disciple making, it's not open to everybody because Jesus chose 12, right? And most of the time he was with that 12. He didn't bring in a bunch more and then a bunch more and then a bunch because then the the uh the personalist is gone the intimacy is gone uh and then the depth uh in a structured program most of the time it's pretty shallow uh i had some folks get a little upset at me when when i was in a previous pastorate for saying if all you come uh to is sunday morning you're going to be on a bottle for the rest of your life because sunday morning is milk teaching and there, I had people disagree with, oh, Brother Carl, your, your sermons are deep. I said, that's because you've never done anything but suck a bottle. Yeah. That's the honest truth. Sunday morning was not meant to be in depth. There's no interaction. There's no conversing back and forth. There's no practicality like we talked about. It's, it's very shallow in depth. And I know some of you probably was like, hey, what he just said, my pastor preached good. Man. I don't care. It's shallow. It's all because it's not designed for that. Right. Yeah. And so when you look at the depth with disciple making, it tends to be more intimate and you tend to be able to go more uh, into a person's personal life to meet their specific needs. Right. And um, you get to know them. it's a lot more relational. So and, and that's the, the next one. Uh, leader relationship in a structured program. Contact tends to be indirect. One indirects with the program more than the person's. The larger a church gets, especially on Sunday morning, Sunday school, Wednesday, you don't even have to really know your pastor, right? Or the Sunday school teacher. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can be in a class for a long time and know very little about that person, right? So, but in Jesus' disciple making, leadership, contact is more direct. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' method, it was really, in some instances, one-on-one -on -one or one-to-three, very personal, very direct. Do you remember what John said? That which we saw with our own eyes, heard with our own ears, and touched with our own hands. John actually leaned back on Jesus' chest. How many of you have done that with your Sunday school teacher? No, I'm <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Is it, it was a lot more personal with the leader because it was more intimate. Uh, feedback, it was Monday this Sunday. Will, Will was the one that did it, so I was preaching, and Will responded back to me. And I responded back to him in my Sunday morning message. And people were like, and I said, I know, I know. We don't I normally do that, you know, because we're taught that the pastor is going to speak and you're going to sit there and be quiet. Where is that in scripture? That's what I said this Sunday morning. Where is that in scripture? Or not the word. It's just be interesting because you're comfortable with me, you know, in mm -hmm. interacting with you as we do this. But I've been in a lot of places where people get real upset because uh, I've spoken while they're trying to teach. Yeah, and it's okay. Now, I, I will admit, I had I had a guy one time in, in a Sunday evening service. He asked me something totally off the wall that wasn't on the subject. And this is what I said. I said, Brother Tommy, I'm going to give you the short answer because that's not what we're talking about tonight. After classes, I mean, after church is over, I'll talk with you in depth about it. I gave him the short answer and we went back on because you can... I was told one time by doing interaction like that is dangerous. You don't know what you're going to get, but I'm not scared. Yeah, no. I'm not scared. We'll handle it like adults yeah. and I want feedback, right? But that's not what we do on Sunday morning. But how did Jesus teach? Jesus said, hey, who's, whose inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, then render unto Caesar's what Caesar's. Render unto God what's God's. Jesus interacted when he talked. All through the scriptures. Well, make it more memorable. Well, well where did we see preaching mostly? Paul. The gospel out there. 
That's where he said, go preach the gospel. But when Jesus taught the disciples in discipleship, they would say, Jesus, that's a hard saying. What does that mean? And Jesus would say, shh, you're interrupting the service. <laughs> so, so now I'm going to go back to your words, right? Because originally you started this with, if you're just showing up on Sunday, that's the milk, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not the time to be cycling, and that's not the time to be talking back and forth. <laughs> no, it's okay to talk back and forth. I didn't. I didn't say don't talk back and forth. We're recorded. Just make sure you do the short it, answer at the long one. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, the short answer. Ron, I'm gonna give you the short answer to that. <laughs> right. But the but the point is is that when Jesus decided, <clears throat> there was interaction. There was interaction, and if you've got a church of two hundred on Sunday morning, you really can't do that. You really can't. Uh, but I, Will, when he spoke Sunday morning, it was kind of like he caught himself and then we laughed and we went on with it, you know, uh, in a small setting like we have, you can answer a question, but you get up to 250 people and you let everybody start doing that. Yeah, it could get out of hand. Uh, so feedback in a structured program is often there is little, if not none, but in a discipleship class, I mean, that's what it's about a two way thing. I mean, that's what it's about. And Jesus treated many of his teaching moments like that. He showed them, he brought a little kid up to him and, and gave an illustration with a little kid, with a coin, with a fish, with seeds. I mean, he, he used visuals and he spoke with them. And, and Jesus asked a lot of questions and I don't think he asked them rhetorically. He wanted an answer. Whose inscription is on this coin? You know, so... And then uh, the connotation, our program will go on without you. If you're not there on Sunday morning, it's going to go on. It goes yeah. on. Yeah. And so in uh, discipleship, you're important because if we're doing one-on-one -on -one and you don't show up, I got nobody to disciple, right? Nobody to And so uh, you're very important when it comes to those smaller groups of discipleship. And in the summary, uh, most of our structured programs that we've developed in the traditional model tend to be very impersonal. And as a matter of fact, the larger you grow, the more impersonal it get. Uh, in disciple making, it's always personal because you're trying to help people to, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You're showing people how to be like Christ and it's, it's always tends to be uh, personal. So I put a note at the bottom here, some would unwise unwisely conclude that we ought to do away with all of our structured programs, organizations, and agencies. First, we should do everything possible to make our programs more personal, direct, and individualized and spontaneous. Second, we should make sure that we are not relying solely on the program or the organization, but are taking steps ourselves to disciple a few individuals. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to tell you to go cancel your uh, Sunday school class. Uh, and then on the back, I'm not going to read this. I put an illustration you can read later, but what the it, it's an illustration about the effects of one-on-one -on -one discipleship. So we're not quite at point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I was. Yeah, Ralph. Ralph was in the Navy back when they had them triangle hats. <laughs> we had the big white things up there making a boat. Oh, that was back when Moses was corporal, right? So I'm still trying to work this over in my head. God gives these gifts to the church. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, me that that's my that's responsibility. Oh, okay. Yeah. Duty <laughs> to take these gifts. You're basically telling me that if I read those scriptures, these gifts require some symbol. So if you remember when I was talking about the evangelism, one of the things that I said under evangelism is, is that as you begin to uh, put together an evangelism strategy, if you aren't that person, like I've got the gift of evangelism, I've wrote material, I teach it, I go to churches, I've taught it in other countries. So evangelism is my thing. So I don't need to raise someone up. But Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. So Timothy's going to start out doing the best he can 
to, to teach his people how to share their faith, to witness and all of that. Mm -hmm. But as quickly as he can, he's going to find somebody who's gifted in it to yeah. turn that responsibility over to them. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I have talked uh, about this with me. I believe that in the early church, they were run by overseers and elders. The word pastor is only used one time in the New Testament, and it's in the book of Ephesians, and it's the passage that you're talking about. And some he gave as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And that's the only place it uses the word pastor, and that's the one we fixate on. When all the other places, Paul talks about to the elders of the churches, overseers of the churches. Mm -hmm. And I believe with all of my heart that in those churches, you had a teaching pastor, but you had a whole group of elders that were equivalent in calling to him. He just did most of the teaching. If you look at the church at Antioch, Barnabas was there. Apollos was there. As a matter of fact, Apollos was teaching at one point. And what happened? Aquila and Priscilla mm -hmm. pulled him aside because he didn't quite have his theology right. And they gave him a little instruction and then he went back into teaching. And so we see that there were multiple overseers and leaders, and they had different responsibilities in the church to oversee the flock. And so uh, there so are going to be. What does that mean, though? What, what does that scripture mean? If you get gifts to the church of these people, where are the people that are supposed to be equipping the same? Well, okay, and, and I, I understand where you're going with that, but he also equipped them with the gift of faith, with the gift of healing, with it. Where are they? That's a good question. Yeah, because I'm trying to, because see, I've been, I was looking for these people when I wanted to learn something. <laughs> sad to say, I'm still looking for some. Right. You know, it's just, it's Maybe they're all like Pentecostal church. Brother, brother, Jason, <laughs> brother Jason would like to address that. <clears throat> It, that I, I think I've got at least a, a partial answer for that. And it, and it was one that uh, it, it hit home this past Sunday because it was good. It was being preached on. And it's the parable of the talents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The master gave the five talents to the one. He took them, multiplied them, brought them back. Gave two talents to the other. He multiplied them, he brought them back. back. Mm -hmm. He gave one talent to one, and he went and hit it. Mm -hmm. Didn't do anything with it. Right. We have been given gifts, and we've been given talents, and unfortunately, that's another area where we've fallen short on, mm -hmm. is that whatever gift or talent that we were given, we have to use it in service for the Lord. Right. And I think that's why Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, whether you're an evangelist or not, because if you're, especially those who are going to plant a church, you're going to have to lead out in that. I mean, that's just the bottom line if you're a planter. You've got to lead out in that evangelistic area, prophetic area. Uh, my understanding of a prophet today, and it's the little p prophet. I'm not, uh, uh, the, when you look at a prophet in the scriptures, his main job was calling God's people back to God. Amen. When we think about prophets today, especially in certain charismatic realms, they view the prophet as, as, as someone who tells the future or sees a word over your head or gives you a word for your life. That's not what you see in the scriptures. What you see in the scriptures of the prophet, look at what Isaiah did. Look at what Joel did. Look at thus saith the Lord. You know, Jeremiah, he went to God's people and said, if you don't repent and turn back to God, this is what's going to happen. That's the prophetic gift. And we do see some of those operating. People who are calling God's people back to God, you know, uh, apostolic gift. And I'll say with a little A, because we could get off on a, a, a theological issue here. Some people believe that the apostles don't exist today. That was an apostolic age to show that Jesus was who he said he was. And I don't want to go into all of that, but a little A apostolic gift. What did the apostles do? They came along and they were visionaries in a new age. They were the ones that were out there on the front lines doing what no one else was doing. And we see people with apostolic gifts today, these, these visionaries, these people like Paul, who were going around starting new works and who were doing things that others hadn't even thought about yet. And so we do have those people out there today. Well, I'm pretty sure we do. I guess I'm going to look for a definition of what those 
actually mean because I'm a, I, I want to find those people. Amen. I, you know, amen. I want to see them and I want to help them. And you may even be one of them. Gifts yeah. That, you know, that they have, but I don't want to be the sole person out there having amen. to put all this together because I can't. Amen. Well, I want, might be the yes. same. Let Brother Archer say what he's going to say. And we, we, we can work on more from the side from that perspective of what those look like and who those people are. But go ahead. Yeah. God's spirit will reveal to you certain personalities and people that you'll see gifts in them. And then your, your responsibility, if you will, as the Holy Spirit guides you to that, is to help, help them to discover that gift and to develop it. So it'll happen. Because people have gifts they don't even know about, mm. you know. I mean, anything well, I when it comes to leadership, now. right? You know what? What? Uh, and I <laughs> use this as my thirty years in the military is finding young men and having them discover stuff that they're able to do they never realized they could, and develop that so that they become. By the time they leave under my leadership, they're a whole new guy. You know, that's that's uh, that's a gift that leadership gives us is the opportunity to bring the very best out of somebody for whatever it is that God has already prepared. And you haven't been just the have leader yet. Be. Huh? This will be your first actual pastor, right? Yes. Yeah. And so some of this, I hope, uh, well, as see, that's what I've been trying to find it within this out here. Right. And, you know, and I haven't been able, I haven't seen that many. Yeah, well, well, you're not I'm, alone. You're not. I'm, I'm looking. I'm we've got leaders right here. here. When I preached a couple of Sundays ago, I even asked the church, I said, how many, you know, apostles do we have? How many prophets do we have? How many were the evangelists? Let, let me give you a word, see, and then I want to move past this, because this is not really goes with this. But, uh, and, and some folks might even get a little bit upset at me saying this, and this is the prophetic side. But the honest truth is, Baptists are scared to death of things they don't understand, like the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, like something that might actually be prophetic. Uh, we, we as Baptists, because we're afraid we're going to get labeled charismatic. And there are, I believe, little P prophets out there, people who, who call God's people back to God. I believe there's little A apostles out there, people who are visionaries, people who are doing things that no, none of the other churches are doing. That's an apostolic style uh, gift. Mm -hmm. And I would remind people that uh, when Paul was preaching that in, in, in Ephesians, that's New Testament. And if we can't apply uh, the New Testament to our lives today, something's wrong. That's what it was given to us for. And so you rarely will hear five-fold ministry in the Baptist church. Uh, but it's we're in reading the same book. Yeah, we're reading the same book. We're reading the same book. So let's move to actually establishing an evangelism strategy corporately. We need to be making uh, disciples. What's that? Oh, let me give you a thing. I don't have one. <laughs> so uh, we've talked about Jesus pouring into multitudes of people. We talked about it going all the way down to even one on one. Uh, but there are some things that Jesus taught uh, in in. In our church right now, we have several individuals who are pouring into young people's lives. They, they actually meet every week on a week-to-week -week basis, uh, sometimes in a restaurant, sometimes in a coffee shop. Uh, most of mine, I do not meet in a public place. Uh, uh, most of the time when I meet with our guys, we meet in, in like at my house or, or here. Uh, but uh, my wife... Catherine is uh, pouring into a young lady that's about 25, 26 years old. Um, the young lady came to my wife, and I was talking about it, preaching on it. If you're a young person in this church and you see somebody that you want to be like, you see somebody that the Holy Spirit is operating through, you see somebody who's living holy in a godly life, and you want some of that, go ask them to pour into you to be uh, your disciple maker or to be your disciple. Mentor. To be your mentor, your to, mentor. to disciple you. That's the word I'm trying to use. And that young lady came to my wife and said, would you be willing to pour into my life? And so my wife meets with her every week. Uh, Brother Don, who he, he was next door, uh, he's pouring into a young man. The young man came to him after we talked about that and did a sermon series on it, came to him and said, hey, 
would you pour into my life? And he said, I'd be glad to. So we've got, uh, matter of fact, most of our leaders in our church are pouring into somebody one-on-one, -on -one, having intentional meetings each week that focus on life. They don't do a Bible study. It's not like that. They talk about what God's doing in their life. They talk about fun things they've done. It's, it's not a, a rigid course booklet that they're going through. My wife is just sharing what God's been speaking to her through her devotional time, helping the, the young lady to journal or whatever they do. I don't know what it looks like because I'm not there. Uh, and she doesn't share much, so which is a good thing. Some is planned and some is spontaneous. Yeah, that's what is on the Amen. sheet. Some is planned, some is spontaneous. And, you know, uh, I think Will and I are doing some of that. Uh, we're going to be doing it tomorrow at an apartment complex, prayer walking together. I mean, that's great discipleship stuff. Uh, and, it, and it's going to be fun and it's different. And, you know, we may, we may run into some kids we can talk to, but we're looking for an open door to get in and have a, a, a new discipleship group, a new community group. I mean, so let's, let's talk about establishing an intentional discipleship strategy within the, the body, within corporately. In Luke 640, Jesus said this, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. And so this is the reason that even me, I have a, a man in my life that pours into my life. He's 89 years old. He's full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and knowledge. He was in two branches of the service. He was a firefighter. He was a chaplain. He's been through two wars. I think I can learn a thing. Right? I meet with him every single week. We pray together. We watch sermons together. Sometimes we listen way too many times to, because he lives in Portuguese. I don't know why, but he just likes that. But uh, right, and none of us speak Portuguese, but we will before it's over, at least that song, right? Pork and cheese. Yeah, pork and cheese, right. So, but, but I have a mentor as well. So it doesn't matter what level you're on. You need someone pouring into your life. Right, I promise keepers, uh, you know, one that from whom you learn mm -hmm. and one from for whom you teach. Right. So I've got a series uh, that talks about that. It's about having a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Yeah. So a Paul in your life is someone who's pouring into you. A Timothy is someone you're pouring into. And a Barnabas is the guy that pats you on the back and tells you everything's going to be all right when Paul hammers you. <laughs> right? All right. In other words, you need an encourager. You need someone in your life that you can go to that's always there to build you up. So that's your Barnabas. So uh, discipleship is about becoming more like Jesus Christ and helping others to do so as well. I give some definitions here, and I do this on purpose uh, because not, not everyone understands all the time what they mean, but intentional is done on purpose. It's deliberate. So an intentional discipleship uh, strategy it's not going to happen on its own. It's not just going to by osmosis appear in your church. It needs to be intentional. Discipleship. A person who is a pupil or adherent to the doctrines of another, one who embraces and assists in the spreading the teaching of another, any follower of another person. And then a strategy is a plan of action or policy designed to achieve an overall plan or goal. So when you take intentional discipleship strategy, is a deliberate plan of action to take people from unchurched and lost to becoming a committed and mature follower of Jesus Christ. That is what an intentional discipleship strategy is for. Right. It's to take an unchurched and lost person to becoming a committed and mature follower of Christ. And when I have asked, this is the fourth year, and when I have asked how many of you have an intentional discipleship strategy in your church and i only had one guy one guy uh that that actually has one and i know the guy that leads it it's in uh, uh west side baptist church in colleen uh bobby and marita jones lead it and it's an incredible discipleship strategy i did have one other guy in our largest baptist church in colleen that said and this guy's got a doctorate degree and he's part of the leadership of their His hispanic branch and he said, on paper, yes. In application, not so much. I've heard another person from First Baptist Queen say the same thing. 
that, that what he said? Mm -hmm. Okay. I wasn't going to name a name, but. <laughs> Amen. First, uh, read the word of life with Absolutely. Freedom Road's got an intentional discipleship path. Amen. Yeah, I'm talking no. about that with regards. No, 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 no. I'm talking about first path. Anyway, y'all can go back to your church and hash that out. Papa J. Tell them what you learned. So we broke the dog. Me and Papa J were on the streets. Yeah. The but the but in the in the corporate setting in your church that you've actually got a path that everybody is going through. No, that's not true. So uh, uh, every church body needs to implement an intentional discipleship strategy to successfully fulfill the great commandment in Matthew 22, 36 through 44. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your strength, and your mind. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then also the great commission, which is what we've been talking about, going and personally making disciples. Um, so the church body must define with clarity what a disciple is and what that will look like in context of that body of Christ. The reason that I say that is because uh, basically what a disciple is isn't going to change among the different churches. That should be pretty much a given. A disciple is someone who is becoming day by day more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Jesus said the pupil will become as their teacher. And so, but in the context of each body, it may look a little bit different. Uh, Brother Ronnie back here said that he really believes that uh, Celebrate Recovery is a discipleship pathway. Uh, the thing is, you've got to convince everyone they have a habit, hurt, or hang up and get in that. Uh, and, and that may be the challenge, unless everybody that comes in comes in through. Well, no, I, I, I see now what you're talking about. You're talking about a program at a church that every single person goes through to make a disciple. So because I'm thinking right now at our church, we have a discipleship program, but it's it's not, hey, this is what you need to do. This actually is the um, Saba San Antonio. They have a little last mm -hmm. a year. You get school credits for it and everything. And that's their discipleship program. But very few, maybe I think they had like four people last year go through it. So very mm -hmm. few. How big is the church? Through. About two hundred people. Two hundred people, and they had four in a year. Well, they say so. they say we got fifteen hundred members, but you know, well, two hundred people show up on a Sunday. You know how that goes. Yeah. But um, we do C three T here in Council for Combat Farm. Mm -hmm. Not only uh, fruitful for individuals, uh, but anybody who wants to learn how to help people that have PTSD in their own church. Mm -hmm. right? It's a 30 hour certificate course. Yeah. Uh, guys are getting two or three credit hours from Excelsior University for it. Um, did it for two years out of Fort Hood at the Spiritual Fitness Center and had fruit from that. Uh, but sort of had three opportunities in different places at churches that ended up diffusing. Mm -hmm. But COVID had a lot to do with that too. But, but that is also very specific. It's not for your average, average housewife to go through. So, so this is about within your church body for everyone to be able to go through it. Uh, and, and most churches that do offer some type of discipleship, it's like an elective, right? right? And so, uh, but, the, but the key though is, is people need to understand what a disciple is. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? I think we call it. Right, we've, we've, well, the, the calling, the moment you got saved and you repented and the Holy Spirit came to dwell within you, you entered a covenant with Jesus Christ to be your disciple. The thing is, what does that look like? Well, number one, to be Christ-like. If What did Jesus say? The pupil will become, once he's fully trained, like the teacher. So the, the number one thing in discipleship is, what are we doing in our churches to help people be Christ-like, right? Uh, so these are the things that we have in, in our own church, but these are some of the things, discipleship goals, to be Christ-like. Worship daily as an individual and corporately on a regular basis. I was just having a conversation with uh, someone earlier about uh, a family went on vacation, um, but while they were on vacation, they also went on a vacation from God. 
no devotions. They did, you know, we're that's wrong. It's a day to day <laughs> thing. It, it is an everyday thing. Worship is not a once a week Sunday morning thing. To me, if you're doing that, you just didn't currently have it to begin with. There's right. no way, even when I'm on vacation, I, I there's no way I can. I mean, coffee and the word is part of my routine of just waking up. Right, but if you if you've been in a church like the one that I was at, the church I got saved at, I came out of the baptistry. They put me in the pew and said, "Come to the appointed services and put something in that plate, preferably ten percent, when it comes around, and you'll be a great church member." And for a while, I was a really good church member, and I was a pathetic follower of Christ because there was nothing spiritual to that, and so. Worship is a daily practice for the individual and corporately on a regular basis. So a, a disciple of Christ is going to be in his word often. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, 365 days a year that I've read four chapters a day of the scripture, you know, but six out of seven days a week ought to be a, a pretty good goal, you know. Uh, every day is the goal. Every day is the goal. You yeah, should say that's just kind of odd. I think I hate to keep beating this, dead horse, right. but it's just so odd to me that once you create the habit, it's like with praying, right? Praying is real hard to do for like 10 minutes. But once you create that habit of 30 minutes, you don't even try. The same thing with reading the word. You're but who taught pray. you that, though? I don't know where I. Well, I heard it in a sermon. I practiced it, but it, okay. it wasn't so like I was decent. I'm going to use my mentor's words against you because he used them against me. Not everybody's like you, Ronnie. <laughs> You're different. They don't all get it like you. Because I right. said the same thing. I'm like, how can Jesus Christ have transformed your life? And you put him on a shelf and only pull him off when you're feeling spiritual. You know, I, I was told by my mentor, Carl, not everyone is Carl Love. You know, and I'm having a hard time accepting that. Not that everybody's <laughs> Carl Love, but but like you said, how could Jesus have hung on that cross from you? And I had a guy tell me, well, I think I've had a spiritual encounter a couple of times in my life. That's a daily thing. It ought to be a daily thing. But but you know what? If people aren't discipled. If people aren't taught what discipleship is, they don't have a clear understanding of what the pupil should look like because they don't know Jesus. If you're not reading the scripture, that's the place you learn who Jesus is and what he did. Now, you can't make people. Get right. Do not conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, uh, Worship daily as an individual, corporately on a regular basis, practice spiritual disciplines. So in our intentional discipleship program, the first thing you do is a 15-week study on spiritual disciplines. We have five weeks on prayer and fasting is included in that. Uh, in, in every church that I have been in, fasting is just a word. It is not practiced in the previous church I was in, I asked my church to fast with me on several occasions, and none of them did. And when I say none of them, I mean virtually no one ever would fast with me. I called Will up today, and I said, hey, Will, uh, I'm not saying you're required to do this, but since we're going to go out tomorrow, I'm going to do a 24-hour fast. I'm going to be praying. And you know what he said? I was already thinking about doing it. He's already in that mode of putting his spiritual disciplines in action. But he's also had the spiritual disciplines class, right? And yes, sir. Are there other types of fasts that a disciple can go on? Yeah, when we teach uh, fasting, and I'll be real brief on that. When we teach fasting, we show people if you've got a medical condition uh, and you can't withhold from all foods, then maybe you can do raw vegetables, maybe a few carrot sticks, some juice. Uh, but you're not going to eat like a big bowl of salad with ranch. You know, it's not, that may be some raw vegetables, but it needs to be. And I, and some people would say, well, what if I fasted from television because I'm kind of addicted to it and I need to pull away. If God calls you to do that, uh, or you feel like you need to do that to pull away from it and to draw close to God, I recommend it. But most of the fasting in scripture was doing away with food and there's a reason for it. 
because when your body gets just a little low on food, it reminds you of how dependent upon God you are. Okay. We are some frail individuals, especially Americans who are used to three meals a day, second breakfast, two snacks, and a midnight pick-me-up, right? So maybe not all of you are like that, but we miss one meal here, and we feel like the, the end of the world is coming, right? So anyway, but I do, uh, in the past, we have had people who fasted from coffee. I'm a coffee addict. I need to, to lay. So they would use a time of prayer and fasting and fast from coffee. But when we practice, especially corporate fasting, we're talking about abstaining from food and we, we are focused on a certain thing uh, uh, that the church collectively is, is praying for. Uh, but I do teach if you're diabetic or you've got a medical issue, when we teach our spiritual discipline study, there's a guide in there on if you drink a lot of coffee and you're going to fast, you better wean yourself. If you don't, by the end of that day, you will be so sick with a caffeine withdrawal headache. Yeah. How did I learn that? Not because someone taught me, <laughs> but because I crawled in the house one day. Uh, the guys that I work with was going to prayer and fast. Uh, over our, our factory and go out and witness. I'd never fasted before. I just withdrew all food. It was in July. It was about 104 degrees. I literally crawled in our front door and my wife is like, what is the matter with you? I'm sick. I crawled in our front door. Guess what? I didn't fast for a long time. And then I did a study, a spiritual discipline study. I learned when you should fast, why you should fast, and how you should fast. So anyway, we, when we teach that, uh, but spiritual disciplines, how to separate yourself so you can actually hear from God. You know, there are people out there that say, God only speaks through his word. I had a pastor tell me that one time. God does not talk to people anymore. He only speaks through his word. I said, then how did you, how did you know what to preach this Sunday? Uh, it is. Now here. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Throw the dark one. So what is the leading of the Holy Spirit if God isn't speaking to us? Right? right. If you take experience in God, God speaks to us through prayer. God speaks through us through his word. God speaks to us through circumstance, through other people. And there's one more. There's five of them. Anyway. So uh, there needs to be these discipleship goals. Participates in community within the church body. Sunday morning was not designed uh, to be intimate. It just wasn't. It's a corporate time for us to come and worship. We create times uh, where smaller groups get together so they can get to know one another. It, it's creating community. Uh, gives of time, talent, resources, and money. And so that's part of spiritual disciplines is learning to orchestrate your, your life in a way that you've got time for God and that's time for the Ronnie, the devotionals you were talking about, the prayer, giving time to God, talents. That's what Brother Sylvester wants to see a little more of from, from the church is talents. Resources. When I was teaching our spiritual disciplines one time, we were talking about resources. Uh, I, I, and I shared this with y'all before, but the lady had never thought about that she was a widow living in a two-story house on the lake. I started talking about opening up a home for a community group. And she goes, wait a minute. I got this big old house. I love people coming over to my house. And then to our benefit, it was at the lake with the big deck. I mean, it was a perfect match, but she had never thought about using her house to glorify God. Resources, tools, whatever you have. Um, right. Serves in the ministries of the church body. Uh, and this is inside and out. So it can be a ministry, street ministry like you and Papa do. Uh, and then reproduces themselves. Disciples should be reproducing themselves. Uh, when you have opportunity, as Miss Tina is going to have, to share her testimony, to witness to her family, she is not in charge of the results, but she's in charge of her obedience to trying to make <coughs> other people disciples of Christ. So if you're going to start an intentional discipleship path in your church, people need to understand what's expected of them. What does that, what does a disciple in this church look like? Uh, and so those were some of the characteristics. You may think some of them are ridiculous. You may think there needs to be more, but those are ones that we have in ours. 
And then the intentional discipleship path, that's what we started calling it, to stay away from that word program because everything seems to be a program. Mm -hmm. uh, attend the new members class. In the new members class, they will learn the mission, vision, and values of the church, the doctrinal beliefs, and what their next step is in the discipleship strategy. At our church on the tables, we sit at round tables. There is a little teepee shaped uh, card that says, what is your next step in the path of transformation? And then it lists the steps. Take the membership workshop, join a community group, uh, begin discipleship classes, make disciples. So they know that, hey, th these are some next steps. What's my next step? On the screen every Sunday morning, we have a, a slide that comes up in PowerPoint that says, what is your next step? in the path of transformation we keep it in front of them all the time so even if you're a new person in our church or a guest pretty soon somebody's going to say okay what's this step thing what's my next step right yeah so uh we don't actually have a new members class we have what we call a membership workshop and the way that works in our church is you take the membership workshop to see if you really want to be a part of our church We've had people who took the membership workshop and said, eh, I don't think I want to be a member of this church. And we say, okay. And we're okay with that because we shared with them what our mission, what our vision, what our values are, what's going to be expected of them if they join. And we're straight up. That way, six months down the road, they don't say, well, why didn't you tell me that you don't let women teach in this church or something, which we, we do let women teach. But if that's an issue, Get it out in the membership class so that people know what that's the doctrine. They'll learn your doctrine. Uh, they'll learn mission, vision, and values. You may have somebody come to your church and they go through a membership workshop and you say, we reach out to drug addicts, people with hurts, hangups, habits. So you're going to see a lot of people that have been down and out. And they may say, I've got little kids. I don't want to be around that. And you say, well, I'm sorry. My kids are Right? <laughs> right? So just be honest up front. And that's what our membership workshop is about. <coughs> you don't become a member by taking the membership workshop. You learn who we are. And then you see if you want to be a member or not. Right? So in our membership workshop, after you take the membership workshop, if you want to be a member, then you sign our covenant. Oh, yeah, that's on the next step. <coughs> uh, on the screen and on the little sign. That's one of the steps. Sign the covenant. Can we call them probate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. MC world. That's a, it's a hang around in a program. That's right. That's right. And we'll figure if you're going to be a fit. That's right. Are you are you going to figure out if you fit with us? Right. There's a time period. Yeah. Yeah. And we have six months. And figure that out. I, I tell you what. Before we go any further, we just started this part. Let's go ahead and take a break. We used to take a break at seven thirty. <laughs> Okay, so uh, some some churches will have a new members class, which will be their discipleship uh, path, but that's not what ours is designed to do. Uh, but I have heard of churches new membership class will be like a a, a 90 day path to help them learn some disciplines, learn about the church. Uh, but our discipleship classes are separate. Uh, it is a one year uh, discipleship path. So if you, uh, if you go through our membership class and you sign the covenant, what you're saying is I'm going to attend the community group. I'm going to take discipleship classes and I'm going to share my personal testimony in my community group or before the church. So those are three requirements for being a member of our church. Sounds like 10% of that extra time you talked about. Amen. Exactly. <laughs> You're a probie so, for a year? Huh? A probie for a year? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, it, they, once they sign the covenant. Oh, they get the patch. Man. They get the patch. Not the patch. The patch. No, they're just. A, they get uh, the bar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's biker talk, y'all. Yeah. They're, they're, they're full patch. Huh? 
No, no. After a year, they're full times. That's right. So discipleship classes. <laughs> Are they probably for a year? Yeah, they're probably they, for a year. In the discipleship classes is where yeah, they learn yeah. spiritual disciplines such as prayer, fasting, giving, serving, witnessing, spiritual gifts. Uh, we take a spiritual gifts inventory, which is just a guide. Uh, but in these discipleship classes, uh, we just assume that people know how to pray. You know, in, in times past, you could be grown and, and you come forward at the church and you get saved and you have an idea what prayer is because grandma used to pray and you'd see her. We are living in an America, and y'all heard the guy last week. He said that only 13% in Texas, only 13% of people were attending church on Sunday. 13%. That means over 85% of people are not attending church. And many of those people, just like me, I was a grown man and never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never heard the, the good news that Jesus died for my sins. I spent the rest of my life looking for that person because I have not found it yet. What, 90% what, of person? the time, the answer you get is, oh, yeah, I'm saved. I know Christ already. Yeah. That's the bigger answer nowadays. Right. But the uh, you get in some of the, well, you are in a San Antonio, Dallas area. Uh, you've got people that, uh, I just heard testimony. I went to a conference called uh, Diaspora. And they're reaching out to internationals, Afghans who are being shipped here. They've never heard of Jesus Christ. So we do have people more and more here who not only don't know the gospel, they don't even know the author of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but discipleship classes are where we teach people to pray. Uh, when I first got saved, I had no clue what prayer was. And no one taught me how to pray. Fasting, <coughs> giving, I was told to put 10% in the plate. That's not how I teach giving. We are in, in our discipleship classes right now. We're teaching a, a part of our discipleship called uh, uh, generosity. generosity. And it teaches us to be generous with our time, talent, resources, and money. It's not mm -hmm. just about money. Yeah, but it's not as bad as the book. It's spiritual. <laughs> yeah, it's not as bad as the book. But see, he's gone through this stuff, so he knows he's, these comments. But in the, in the generosity study, it's teaching you uh, and we haven't got there yet, but it, it's going to give a ladder and it asks you questions and you have to put where you're at in your generosity. The bottom one says, I'm greedy and stingy. I don't give nothing. <laughs> oh, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. And it goes up the ladder. And when it gets to 10%, it says, I'm a legalist. I give what's required. Mm -hmm. And it's got stuff in between and it's got several above that. To give what's required, it's so much greedy. But right. So what it does is it gives you a realistic uh, understanding of where you're at, but then it lets you set the goal of where you want to be. And especially if you've got somebody discipling you, it helps you to get to that point. So we don't just stand in the pulpit and say, you need to give 10%. What if God tells you to give 50? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to join my church and be obedient to his command. Um, there's, there's I'm going to your graph. At this place where tithing is a regulatory thing, uh, but the offerings that come after that, you can never outgive God. Amen. And, and that's what. And that's teaches. where you learn the reaping of of that uh, that joy uh, when you're given you're giving an opportunity, uh, and and God is always looking for those who will equitably distribute his graces, and like the talents wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. The gentleman over here was talking about that, and uh, you know, the more you give, the more God provides for you. So you mm -hmm. can give. You know, it, he who has been given much, much is expected. Is expected. That's right. So the discipleship classes <clears throat> are where we teach people how to be like Jesus, <clears throat> and almost all of it is written from the perspective of this is what Jesus did, this is what he showed his disciples, this is what's expected of you, and then community groups. Uh, we model our community groups after Acts chapter 2. The disciple will experience Bible study, prayer, fellowship, and partaking of a meal together. Now, some, some churches have the traditional Sunday school, Wednesday night. That's fine. Uh, but that can't be the extent of your discipleship pathway. Because most of those look, you know, Sunday school and Wednesday usually look pretty similar. 
uh, and you don't you don't uh, experience community in it. So like in our community groups, we meet for two hours. In the first part of it, we have a meal together and we visit with one another. We fellowship with one another. We pray for one another in those groups. There are times when we'll lay, we'll put somebody in a chair and we will lay hands on them and pray on them. And so they're a lot more intimate and it's to help us build community. And just like we had a meeting this past Sunday, it was not a business meeting. We call ours family meetings. We are trying to get our people to understand that we are a family. We're not a business. We're not an organization. We're the family of God. And so we try to build community ministry opportunities. Uh, the church body should have a clear path to areas inside the church body and outside the church body where the disciple can use their gifts and talents to serve in various ministry opportunities. Teaching children, praise team, choir, food bank, prison, host a community group. You see, the lady that I had talked to had never thought about opening her home for one of our community groups. So now she's using her gift of hospitality and the resources that God's given her and the church body benefits from it. So she, she experienced two things. One, she already knew she had the gift of hospitality, but she never thought about inviting people into her own home to use it. We were rotating and bringing meals. I'd bring a meal one week, this person would bring a meal. She said, since we meet in my house and I love to cook anyway, how about if I just cook every week? And I said, absolutely not, your food stinks. No, I said, of course you can, because she's an awesome cook, right? So every now and then we would get together and say, next week, you're off the hook. We're going to bring something. But 90% of the time, <laughs> she provided the home. She provided the meal. So now she's using her gifts. She's using her resources mm -hmm. for the body of Christ. So, and then reproduce themselves. The church body should have a clear evangelism <clears throat> strategy for training and equipping the disciple, how to share their testimony and witness to their family, friends, and coworkers. We talked about that last week. We've, we've done several evangelism models in here but it needs to be a clear path, the same thing that you're leading everyone through. By being consistent like this, somebody doesn't have to come to Pastor Carl and say, hey, Pastor Carl, remember that thing you taught? Will can be sitting in a community group and they start talking about it. And Will's, they can ask Will, why? Because we're all doing the same consistent program or pathway. Uh, and then personal discipleship. This is what we talked about earlier. A Paul Timothy or Naomi Ruth relationship. The church body should have a mentoring strategy to partner new followers with mature disciples to help them grow in their walk with the Lord. Sometimes you need to have someone you can trust. You're not going to do this in Sunday morning. You're not going to do it in a community group. But one-on-one, -on -one, you can say, this is what I'm struggling with. How can you help me to get over this? And you tr you trust that person. You're meeting one on one with them. You have uh, trust that they're not going to blab your issues to everybody. That they're actually praying for you and they're modeling what that looks like in their own life too. Uh, and then also the Paul Timothy or Naomi Ruth, where uh, I think I said it backwards here. No, I, I did it right. So yeah. the disciple becomes the mentor and begins to disciple others. So. You can be like myself. I've got two mentors, actually. One of them I meet on a weekly basis with. The other one I don't get to meet with as often, but I do meet with him. Uh, but I have somebody pouring in my life every single week. But I'm also pouring into other men's life. Right. Every one of us need to have somebody smarter, more uh, influential, with more experience pouring into our life. It also needs to be somebody that loves you enough that'll say, Sylvester, that ain't right, right? But they're doing it out of love, not just trying to be critical. If all you're going to do is criticize without praying for and helping them to get through it, you're just being me, and that's not Christ-like. So uh, my both of my mentors have looked at me more than once and said, brother, you can do what you want to do, but I, you're wrong. And I had to pull back and go, ow. And then it teaches you something. How do you respond to someone who loves you enough to tell you, to tell you the truth? Amen. And that's where maturity begins to come in. And do you know what else it does? When you have to do that to somebody you're mentoring, uh, you're a whole lot more graceful 
because you've experienced yourself. <laughs> this is what it's about. It's about having people pour into us, us pouring into the next generation. We form accountability partnerships, right? Right. So we have this, uh, and I'm not saying we have it perfect. Trust me, I've got folks in my church here tonight that will tell you we're a brand new church. And I have not been in a church yet that had an intentional discipleship path except the one I pastored and introduced the discipleship to. Uh, so we're, we've seen some mistakes. We're making some changes. We're doing some things. But if somebody was to say, hey, Pastor Carl, does your church have an intentional path to take someone from an unchurched lost person to a committed follower of Christ? I can honestly say, yes, we do. And it's in practice. It's in practice on multiple levels, on a corporate level and on one-on-one -on -one individual level. And uh, we have community groups that are building community, <coughs> praying for one another, uh, hopefully going to do a little bit better job of reaching out to their neighbors. Um, but we're still working it out, you know. But we do have an intentional discipleship pathway. And as we've learned tonight, uh, it's missing in the church today. It is missing in the church today. The last thing I want to share with you, um, and I know you feel like you're probably being flooded with a fire hose, but uh, that's why we have these handouts so you can go back and kind of absorb it. Uh, you can look at these videos again on YouTube, uh, like our brothers in Uganda. Uh, listen to it again if you need to. Um, and like I said, especially you planters, I will have a flash drive that has the whole discipleship pathway that we do. And uh, I've offered it to some brothers in other churches and they act like they didn't want it. And I mean, you can't make people put it into place. I've given it to churches, uh, your church, and said, you know, this this is something to start with if you find something better take away from it add to it but it's better than what you got because you don't got anything right start with something and make it better so we got what yeah he said zero so let's talk about this membership class or membership as in our church it's called a membership workshops oh um, I should just start well, passing just, it out. We're in charge of all paperwork. Yeah, we're in charge of all That's what God said. They see the work. That's right. <laughs> I'm usually good with the details, but not tonight. So, so especially pastors, but churches know that every guest that visits is a potential member. And having a membership class helps visitors know what membership in the church looks like. Many churches do not have any form of membership class. Uh, you come forward on Sunday morning and say, I want to join the church. And they vote you in right there. And then you go back and sit down, and that's usually where you sit every Sunday. Come sit in the same spot. And you start getting territorial over the pew. We won't go anywhere. It's where Stone sits in his own pew, right? In the last three exactly months, right. my church has changed that. We're no longer calling people to the altar. The pastor does, he gets down and goes by the door and talks with people because now he's expecting them to do new members class before they become new members. So, but I don't know where the voting is coming in, involved in voting them in as new members because I never see that no more. In the past six months, it hasn't been. That. So I'll address that real quickly. They probably put something in the bylaws and constitution that it says that if you are willing to go to this class and, and verbally agree that you're going to follow the doctrines, the, the policies, the procedures, the constitution, the bylaws, and you've been baptized by immersion, they're going to, they're going to read these things and agree. To it. And so the church is basically voted by saying if they're willing to say yes after going through this, then we'll accept them into membership. So that's probably how they're, they're handling that uh, because we don't vote on it either. Once you come to the membership workshop and we tell you that before God and everybody here, you're going to sign this covenant or not. And if you're willing to lie to God and us, we can't help you anyway. <laughs> so, so once you sign that covenant, you're saying, I agree with the doctrine. I agree with the mission, vision, and values. And I see what's expected of me and I know what I can expect from this church. 
See, in our covenant, it's a two-way thing. Mm -hmm. We say, and what you can expect from us is this, and it's lined out. And so when they sign that covenant, they know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think it's wise what your church did. So uh, membership class will help visitors to better understand the history, beliefs, vision, and what the church desires to accomplish in the kingdom. It will also allow the visitor to interact with other potential members as well as leadership. Membership classes are also less intimidating than walking an aisle on Sunday morning to join a church that you know nothing about, right? Mm -hmm. So my wife has said this many, many times. Uh, what is our profession of faith? I mean, what do we do to show our profession of faith? What is the outward public profession of faith? Baptism. It's baptism. That's right. And so we insist that our outward profession of faith is walking down an aisle. But our profession of faith is our baptism, right? Well, what if you've already been baptized? Do you need to walk an aisle to be your public profession of faith? Yeah. Or can you go to a membership class and meet the requirements mm -hmm. and join the church and the church be okay with that? Some churches can't handle that. If you don't walk that aisle, <clears throat> you're not getting baptized. If you've been baptized, you don't walk that aisle, you're not being a member of the church. It's pretty rigid. And I don't know that it's biblical, you know? So uh, sometimes we uh, find places where they, adhere to the letter of the law and completeness. Exactly, exactly. So um, notice that I talked about potential uh, members who are already Christians. Now, if somebody who isn't saved, you need they need to know how I can go about getting saved in your church. Uh, we give invitation for that. But when you come forward, uh, in which I don't give an invitation every week, this past week, I just prayed over everyone. Uh, we've, we're fairly small. I can tell everybody in here has signed the covenant. We're not going to do an invitation for salvation, right? So, uh, but, but people need to know how they can receive Christ. You need to be clear about that. And if someone comes up, we'll let them receive Christ. Our job is to get them in the kingdom. But if you want to be a member of the church, you still have to go. To the so you can be baptized into the kingdom in our church and not be a member of our church yet. You still need to go to the membership workshop. So what about if you have letter of profession, though? We don't do letters of profession. Mm. You know why? There's because no church is like your church. <laughs> no, there's a there's a there's a better reason than that. We don't do letters of profession because typically when I pastored my previous pastor, we were a Southern Baptist church, and 90% of the people that joined our church were not from a Baptist denomination. They won't honor a letter anyway. Oh, I would think that it would have to be from a Southern Baptist right. church in order to be a letter of profession, period. But did you hear what I said? 90% of the people who were joining our church that were Christians were coming out of the Catholic church, coming out of the Pentecostal church, coming out of the church of Christ, those three main ones. So they're not going to, uh, our church wouldn't accept a letter from them anyway. Now, I didn't make that rule. They did. And most, ba most <laughs> Methodist churches won't accept a letter from a Pentecostal church. Right, I agree that yeah. to me that wouldn't even be a letter of profession. Right. When, when it comes to that case, it's more you're already right. part of San Antonio Baptist organization and you're just moving. So I'll tell you real briefly why we just don't do that either. Because if you come out of a hyper Calvinistic Baptist church, you're still Baptist. But you're going to come into our church and say that only the elect are going to go to heaven and the rest of y'all are going to hell. <laughs> Right. They're Baptists, but that's not what we believe, right? So we want them to understand what we believe in this body. We're not saying they're not safe, but then that's going to create division. They need to believe what we believe. So the membership workshop helps even among Baptists to understand doctrine. <coughs> a, a friend of ours uh, was in a church that was closed communion, where if you're not a member, you can't take communion. We were a part of a church that wanted to do that. No and this is what I said. I'm okay with us being like that, but don't do communion on Sunday morning. Do it on an off day where only members can come. If you're going to have closed communion, don't do it on Sunday morning and then tell my grandma, who's been a Christian longer than my pastor's even been alive, that she can't do communion. 
See? Yeah, that's crazy. But, but do you know what? It's Baptist. They would accept a letter. So we want them to go through the membership class so that they can understand that if you come here, we don't do no closed communion. If you want closed communion, we recommend you find a different church. And if you're a saved believer, I don't care. Go wherever you want to go, right? And if it's a lost person, they don't know anyway. So you're teaching them what you you believe. So uh, I'm gonna make a comment. I read something. Uh, I guess it wasn't a month ago. It said some religious denominations are so structured that it's like pouring lead into a mold, and when it hardens, we fling it at the heads of those who don't believe the same way we do. And, and but the deal is though, some in our denomination. Even other Baptists within our denomination. Sure. So, but let's let's uh, digress from that because we are Baptists and we're we have faults and praise God He's got grace. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. So we're going to look at ten elements that should be in a member class. Uh, these topics will help potential members make a decision about joining the local church body. An introduction, make everyone feel welcome and comfortable. Uh, allow for a time of introduction from themselves. You know, that way every, everybody can, it might even be good if, if you have a, a, a membership workshop to let everybody sign a, I mean, not sign, but a, a, make a name tag like we just did at the annual meeting. And that way they can see their name and not have to go, hey, you. Uh, hey, you. <laughs> so, but introduction is good. Um, and then history. <laughs> Share a little history of how and when the church was started. Uh, many of our older churches have a rich history. Share some of the high points. Whether the church body is a new start or a very old congregation, it's good to share some history with potential members. I put this in here because <coughs> I asked one of my mentors, not the one that's a member of my church, but the one who's not, I asked him to come sit in on our first membership workshop and critique him. I asked him to come tell me what would make it better? And he did. He had a whole list of stuff. I was like, I don't mean to critique it like that. But but he did. He came and, and he sat through our membership workshop. And when we got done, he said, overall, it was good. But I think you it was too long. You need to do this. You weren't enough on the expectations. And I mean, he gave me a whole list. So I went back and I took what he said and I, and I revamped some of our stuff. Uh, you need an outsider sometimes looking at it. And uh, this is the first church that I've got to actually, from scratch, make the membership workshop. So I wanted someone who is a little smarter than me, who's in, on the outside looking in to come and critique me. Uh, and Oh, and that's what he said. He said, you didn't tell anybody how you got the vision for the church. You didn't share how this is a new church plan. Tell them how it came about. And I was like, okay. So I ended up going back and putting that in here. Uh, identify the pastor, leadership, and staff. Uh, the member class is a wonderful time for learning who's who in the church body. Having a PowerPoint slideshow with pictures would be perfect. And I did have a PowerPoint to go with what they were looking at. Uh, but if you're an established church already, we're a church plant. We don't have a lot of staff. We've got a young lady that works with the children, the pastor's wife, and myself at that time. That was it. Uh, but if you're an established church, and you've got four families in your membership class, show them who the youth pastor is on the slide. Show them who the children's minister is. Right. You know, so uh, mission, vision, and values. And this is so important because this will deal with those issues like we were just talking about, closed communion or, or any of those other issues. Uh, it helps them to see what the mission of the church is, what vision you have for where that church is going to go, what kind of ministries they're going to do, what the priorities, uh, deepest beliefs and the heart of the church body will come out in the mission, vision, and values. And that will also help them to know, hey, uh, if there's somebody who, who at one time in their life struggled with an addiction and they were to go to Brother Ronnie or uh, Sylvester's church, they're both going to offer a recovery program. Uh, they get in there and they start reading the mission, vision, and values, and they go, hey, I can relate to this. I want to be a part of this. I want to support this. I wanna, tell me what I can do, right? It helps to solidify and, and unify potential members. 
strategic objectives. Every church body needs to have strategic goals for accomplishing its mission and vision. Mission and vision of the church body gives them clear picture of where the church is going. But the strategy provides practical steps to get there and how they can play a part. So I had several slides talking about uh, we're calling our local missions uh, urban transformation. We're calling our global missions global transformation. And we talked about reaching into orphanages, uh, persecuted church, uh, what were some of the other ones? Uh, unengaged, unreached people groups, giving them ideas of things we're going to support so that they'll want to be a part of it. Statement of faith. This is this is what would actually address some of those doctrinal issues. Um, some people feel very, very, very strong about doctrinal issues. Some people just, yeah, they don't care about that stuff. Uh, you tell them we preach Jesus and they're okay. That's all they need to know. Uh, but other people want to know specific. And I even put, even within denominations, there are a variety of differing beliefs about specific scriptures. These beliefs should be stated with scriptural references to support the belief. And I put how ordinances are observed. Uh, in a previous church that I pastored, I allowed someone besides me to do a baptism, and that caused a little conflict. And I just simply asked the person, could you show me one reason, scripturally, why that person couldn't baptize the person they led to Christ? They couldn't do it. But in that church, there, there's this thing that's called the procession of baptistry, that Jesus baptized the apostles, the apostles baptized ministers who then baptized people. Apostolic procession. Apostolic procession. John exactly the Baptist. <laughs> he was Baptist, brother, and he was, you know. <laughs> Where do you fit into that large scenario you just said? Started. It's so, an interesting dynamic to think that from the hands of Christ who baptized, there has been a touching that has taken uh, the, the spiritual portion of this, the physical touch of transformation of spiritual movements going all the way through uh, this part. But even Not Jesus... Like succession. 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 Right. succession is what it's But like. even what Jesus said, the command was to us to go make disciples and what? In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, uh, in some churches, believe that only ordained people yeah. should baptize. Yeah, only the Father. Yeah. And in, in our church, uh, as a matter of fact, I had one of our biker guys, of course, he's, he's ordained, but he wasn't a member of our church. I had him come to our church because the young man requested that he be baptized by him. Okay, sure. So, in as long as, long as uh, I had dads baptize their own kids in our church, and as long as that dad's a believer and he's living it, why not? I've had, I've had both mother and dad. Now, I'm in the baptistry. I'm the one doing the talking, but I let them baptize their own kid. How, how much greater of an experience can the child and the parent have from, from being able to do that? And so, but in some churches, that will never happen. Your kids, but in the go for it. That's right. So, uh, you have ways of putting things in. Also, take the ordinances, for example. Uh, in the previous pastorate that I was at, only ordained deacons could pass out the crackers and the grape juice. Well, yeah, that's well, a Baptist. Thing. Yeah. Well, guess what? I got down to two bat to two uh, deacons, and one of them had severe Alzheimer's. So we had to take him and put him up there with the plate and just say, "Stand right here, brother. Whatever you want me to do." And he just stood there. So we had to have a hundred people walk to the front. Because I had to have one deacon. And finally, I told them, y'all got my back against the wall. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we need more deacons. And I said, well, your rule is the rule that says they can only be married once, right? Yep. So even that is one of those doctrinal issues that people need to understand. And so finally, see, you can be a drug addict, in prison, ex-convict pastor and pass out the crackers. But you been married once. If you only remember, like, right. <laughs> so I was able to bring in some ministers to help with the Lord's Supper, but I was going to bring in just some godly men in the church, lay, lay people. They're not ordained. And I was like, I didn't know you had to be ordained to pass out. That in the so that's what I'm talking about. In, the, in your statement of faith, people need to understand what it's going to look like, you know? So, and then 
what the church expects from members. This is important too. Most churches don't expect anything from them. You walk the aisle. Well, they would like you to put something in the plate, but, but there's no there's no expectation. Uh, like in our church, a profession of faith, baptism by immersion, participation in a membership class. They need to understand what do you want them to do when they become a member. Keep the pews warm. What members can expect from the church body? I think this is important too. Uh, communicate to the potential members that the church will facilitate an atmosphere for their spiritual growth and illustrate what that will look like in the church. So they're going to have sound biblical preaching, community groups, discipleship training, ministry and missions opportunities, counseling. Let them know what, what the church is going to provide for them as well. Uh, safe place for their children. I didn't put that on there. That'd be a good one to put. Uh, in our policies, we put that everybody that works with children is going to be background checked and child protective trained. Yeah. No, you have cops at the so, well, but that also makes parents go, "Hey, I like that." Yeah, you know. So, uh, church governance. This is another important oh, thing. Man. Can we leave that one out? Mm -hmm. We just talked about this in our family meeting uh, Sunday. This may not matter much to some people, but others, it's very important. Communicate to your potential members what the leadership structure looks like and how decision making is accomplished. Many Baptist churches are autonomous and congregationally led. People may have been raised in a different culture. Uh, church culture may not understand what this means. The unchurched people will surely not understand it. And so I explained to our congregation yesterday that, that right now is a mission, and y'all be mission churches as well. We are under the governance of what's called a strategy planning team. So we have representatives from Texas Baptist, representatives from Bell Baptist, and our sponsor church pastor and me are our strategy planning team. Everything I do runs through them. They look at all of our financial things. They're the leadership of our church until we are no longer a mission. Once we are no longer a mission, we will have a bylaws and constitution in place and our people need to know what their role is. And we will be a hybrid. We are not gonna be a congregationally led church. And in my 20 years experience uh, of congregationally led churches, at some point in time, you get people who think they know better about running a church than those who've been trained. And it leads uh, usually to the downfall of the church or divisions in the church. So we're going to be elder led, which is what I see in the scripture. But there were some things in the scripture that you see the congregation doing it said that when they chose deacons the apostles told the congregation choose seven men among you right so we see the congregation had a seven. but what did paul tell titus he said go to every city and appoint elders in every church right? but we see some some almost dictation but we see some congregation led Church governance is important and they need to know that because you don't want them to join the church and then they start saying, well, you, we, we need to do this and I say we vote on this, but we don't vote here. Well, if I don't have a say, I'm not going to be a part of this church. It'd be, it'd be better for them to know that in the very beginning, right? So, uh, and then allow for some question and answer time. This is very important. Uh, if they're I also say if there's something you'd like to ask me, maybe that you just want to ask me in private, you can ask me, but give a time for some question and answers. But these are some things that would make a membership class uh, effective and, and give people an understanding. And membership is part of discipleship, right? And so hopefully with these three pieces of paper will help uh, you to better plan out so and so over here led this young man to Christ what is his next step well in most churches they would say well he needs to start coming to church on Sunday okay well, what's his next step after that uh, is he baptized you know there's no real plan for what his next step is 
So no matter what level of spirituality you are in our church, there's a next step for you. There is a next step. And so was that? Right. And so it no matter where you are in your walk, you know, well, uh, I'm in a community group. You don't have to be a member of our church to be in a community group. We've had people come to our community group, never, never been to our Sunday service. After they've come to the community group, they say, okay, these people are all right. So they go check out the Sunday service. Well, what's your next step? Well, they're already in a community group. Next step would be the membership workshop. Next step is signing the covenant. Next step is once you sign that covenant, you've agreed to share your testimony. You've agreed to take the Cypress request. They can see a clear path of what it looks like to be a disciple in our church. So, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh, What's your question? yeah. The church planting. Well, I mean, you said, you said that out of the church planting, we're a mission church. Mm -hmm. And a mission, mission church, we're going to have a governance body, mm -hmm. right? They're going to Say what goes and what doesn't go. Mm -hmm. say, so what is this for then? The, the governance part of it? No. This, oh, the membership? Yeah. Well, you, just like not. I mean, who's who's this for? <laughs> you, well, it's cool for you. Just like, just like yesterday, we had a family meeting. And we talked about the fact that for the next one year, we're still under mission status. We're still governed by the strategy planning right. team. But we are already still putting leaders in place, leaders of community groups, uh, children's leaders. Um, but every quarter, I give a, re a report back to this strategy planning team, and they're going to ask me questions about it. And they're not dictators. They're just overseers. They're, but we don't have an active bylaws and constitution yet. Okay. We are working on that right now. By the end of this year, we have to have something ready to put in place. But I don't want to spring it on my people at the end of three years and go, oh, by the way, you don't get a vote. You see, when they first join, they need to know those things that when we get off a of mission status. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, yeah. You're doing this as you're, yes. you're going. So this is not just something that you wait on. Mm -hmm. No, we already have this in place. And, and we are working on a bylaws and constitution as we speak. And we already have uh, a covenant. Right. In your constitution, and uh, one of our classes will be creating governance, uh, policies, procedures, uh, constitution, bylaws. Right. Almost all churches have uh, uh, a covenant in their constitution. And so we've already written our covenant. People are already signing it. Well, when we actually have our own bylaws, uh, it'll be in there. And it's already written. People are already signing it. Uh, if you go to the Texas Baptist website, you can look up samples of uh, bylaws and constitution, uh, job descriptions, all of that. But we're gonna we're gonna cover that. Right. This is right. I was just wondering why right. we put this in place already because we don't want to wait until somebody joins our church the first year. And then the third year, we spring it on them. Yeah. So, yeah. This board, yeah. whoever, whoever, are they going to have some kind of structure uh, thing like this to look at or what their expectations are? I don't know there because you're going to be under a different one. Yeah. Yours will be uh, partially in New Mexico. Right. So I don't know what it'll look like. Um, this one is the uh, um, Say I was here. Would they be? There are some guidelines. Yes, okay. there's stuff That's on paper similar to what we're reading now. Yes. It's, it's, so they'll say, okay, this is what we need you to do. Right. It's going to say that they don't recommend you purchasing any property without going through the strategy planning team. If you're going to make any major decisions like that, they want it to go through the strategy planning team. Uh, but that's for church planners in specific. Uh, but some of, some of these guys in here are already in established churches, mm -hmm. and they probably can't. Uh, who in here is at an established church where you've read your church covenant, where you've read your bylaws and constitution? You, yeah, you have. 
You've perused it, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, I agree with her. <laughs> <laughs> you perused it. Yeah, it wasn't like I sit down and like. So let me give you an example. When when I pastored the church, we had a lady who came out of another denomination. She did not want to be baptized by immersion. She had been baptized, but it wasn't by immersion. Matter of fact, she had no, she wasn't Catholic. She wasn't Methodist. She was Lutheran. But she had been she had been baptized by two different denominations of churches, but it wasn't by immersion. And so and she wanted to teach, but she hadn't joined the church. And so I told her, we'll need you to come forward and join the church. And she said, well, what does it take to be a member of this church? And so I got the bylaws and I said, you have to be uh, baptized by immersion or come by statement of faith, having been baptized by a like uh, faith denomination. Uh, so if, if you were Nazarene, and you're willing to say Jesus is Lord, and I was baptized by immersion, that church would accept you. Well, not all churches will do that. Uh, so there were several things. And so she said, I have to be baptized again. And I said, if you've never been baptized by immersion, in order to be a member of this church, you have to be baptized by immersion. She said, I'm not going to do this. And I said, okay. I'm not mad at her. I'm not. But that's what the church rules are. And she was a scuba diver. So exactly. <laughs> but then I had an older member of the church, a lady, come to me and just rip me up one side and down the other for making rigid rules. That is a wonderful lady, and she would be a good teacher. And I don't know why you're being like that. And I let her go. And when she was done, I said, Do you know why we have that rule? And she said, Why? I said, Because you voted on it. Long before I was ever your pastor, you <laughs> let her have it. And she said, Got him. She said, How is that? And I said, Ma'am, do you know why we're called Baptists? It's been in our theology for hundreds of years. We believe in baptism by immersion, it's in the bylaws and constitution, and you voted for it. So you're the reason she's not a member of this Goodness church. Sake. John yeah. the Baptist did John it to Jesus. <laughs> but but the, the bottom line is it doesn't matter whether I agree with that or not. The church voted it into their bylaws and constitution. I was just trying to uphold their uh, rules. And then you know what she said? Well, that's a dumb rule. Uh, Maybe it is. And I said, if you would like to change it <clears throat> in our next business meeting, Tell our Baptist church why we don't need to baptize by immersion anymore. And we'll, if they're willing to vote for the change, then we'll change it. It was never mentioned to me again. Uh -huh. But I didn't make the rule. But this is a church member. And the reason why I say membership class, especially if you're in a new church, because this was a lady been a member of that church for 20, 30 years. Yeah. that didn't even know what the church believed. Didn't even know what makes us Baptist, right? And then ripped me up one side and down the other for something I didn't even do, yeah. right? Now, yeah. I've, I've learned to be a duck. It just rolled right off. And then when I was got done, I told her she's the one that's made it where she could have. So these are, this is exactly what I'm talking about. It will save you guys that are planting a church. Uh, you know, I've used several examples. There's some, some Baptists that don't believe women ought to be in the pulpit. And so don't wait till somebody joins your church for a year and then his wife says, I'd like to lead the adult Sunday school class. And you go, oh, you're a woman. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what your stance is on that. I'm just giving you an example. Right. It had been better if they went through a membership workshop and she looked down and goes, baby, they're not going to let me teach here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then we won't join this church. We'll go on down the road. No feelings have gotten hurt. Right. No. You were honest up front. That's why... We need these things. Yeah. Even in our own denomination, there are Baptists that believe it's okay for women to teach. There are Baptists that believe they can't. And so the way I look at it is don't backdoor stuff. It's a waste of people's time. It causes division. It'd be better to get it out in the open and then move, let them move on if they want to. So those are just some examples. Closed communion, Honest women in the pulpit. Front. What's that? Honest and upfront. Yeah. Did you say women in the pulpit? Right. So... There, there are Baptist churches that don't believe that women ought to be in any teaching capacity uh, except children. I won't recognize that in preaching, but 
you're telling me there's some that believe that they can't even teach? No, that's it's, right. it's, not, it's even uh, not even a youth group. Wow. And that's in from Baptist to Baptist. That's not another denomination. This is the reason right. that we don't accept a letter. Because you, I don't know what you, you're, the church you came out of believed in, even though we're both in the, in the Southern Baptist Convention. So, so that's the reason for that. Well, what was crazy is they would supply that letter, us deacons would read it, and then they would still go through the new members class. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what the letter really did, to be honest with you. It's tradition. Oh, that's what we've always yeah. done. The, the and it was always the older traditional service that would bring those letters. You know? Right, right. So it's, any uh, other questions? Well, All right, one more question. What is your definition of unchurched? Okay, because you keep saying unchurched and lost. The reason I say well, like if they're lost, they probably don't go to church. <laughs> but if, you, if I use the term unchurched, because I've never understood yeah. that, because I, even yeah. though I don't go into your buildings, right. I still go to church. Right. The, the reason I say unchurched and lost is because there are people who are churched and lost. And then there are people who will claim to be a Christian and they have not been in a church in 20 years. They're not church. They're not, they're not affiliated with the church. They don't identify with the church. And then there are those that are unchurched and lost. So you, uh, I baptized in, in the last church I was in about 18, 16, 18 people that were supposedly members of the church and they were lost. They came to me and said, I ain't never done what you just preached. What, tell, tell me what you mean. Because I try to tell them, well, if, if you did come forward in, in VBS and the Lord knew your heart, you're saved. Maybe you hadn't been living it. I try to give them the benefit of the doubt. But like that trucker I had, he said, no, pastor, I'm just a foul mouth trucker. I'm going to hell. I need to get right. I was baptized in this church and I need to get right. Well, what do you do to that? You say, okay, let's get it right this time. See, he was lost, but he was churched. He'd been churched a lot. He could tell us more of the traditions of that church than I could. And then do you know what? I baptized his grandpa at 70, who had been a member of the church for, since 1998. I baptized him in 2018. He'd been a member of that church for 20 years. And he came up to me and said, Pastor, I have never done what you said in that sermon. He said, I prayed a prayer. I don't know what I prayed. And he said, but... I don't feel like I'm right with God. And I said, well, you've been a member of this church for 20 years. I think you know what to do. He said, yeah. He started crying. He broke down and prayed, repented, asked the Lord to put his spirit in him. And I baptized him at 70 years old. Amen. So that's that's why I differentiate between unchurched and lost because there's a lot of so church people going to hell. Unchurched uh, structurally or... Uh, some type of discipline as far as learning what the church is about. There are people that I believe are saved that don't go to church. They're not affiliated with the church. They haven't been to church since they were a kid. Uh, they got baptized, say, in a youth group or whatever. They went off to college. They strayed. They've never got back in a church. They don't identify with the church. It's not my place to say, you're bound to be lost. So I just say they're unchurched. They're saved. But they are not in fellowship anywhere. They are not a part of a body anywhere. So they're unchurched. That's, okay. that's, that's a fair assessment. That's what me and Papa do. If we're out there on that street, and we'll bring them people, and we'll pray over them, and we say, "Hey, we pray over them." I prayed over trucks. I prayed over walkers. I pray on cruise ships. <laughs> there are Bible studies on cruise ships. People who could hardly speak English. We started these people ended up going to somebody's church i don't care which one you go to and i got blessing stickers by 18 wheelers going up and down this highway because i prayed with truckers and i prayed with bikers i pray with anybody i see i'll, I'll stop praying with them in walmart a lot of people they don't talk to each other in their church they don't talk to people in their own church in the next pew, they won't talk to each other. <laughs> I go out and I'll stumble across somebody and say, hey, what's wrong with your foot? They got a cast on or one of them big foot. What's wrong with your foot? Can we pray over them? 
Maybe you try to go to where? Or sure. That's what me and I'm just trying to figure out. But I'm, I'm glad that you asked those questions me, because yeah. that was a yeah, those are right there. That, those spiritual but I, knowledge. I saw Brother Cody when I said that shake his head. Yes, there are plenty of people who are church and lost. And then there's people that I do believe, for whatever reason, they have fallen out of fellowship. They identify with no church anywhere, haven't been in 20 years. I went to a lady at Walmart and she said, I haven't been to church in so long. I'm not even going to grace the doors. And she believes she's saved. And whether she is or not, it's not for me to determine. She's definitely a disobedient Christian and wonders why nothing goes right in her life. But that's not for me to judge. So I would say maybe she is saved. Maybe she's not. God will determine that. But she's definitely not connected to a body anywhere. So uh, if there's not any more questions, I'm going to close this in prayer. I did have a, uh, one announcement for next week. Next week's class is not going to take the whole time. Uh, I had it on the syllabus as a class lab. And so because we had the guest speaker last week, uh, that was not, uh, that was kind of sprung on me, which I think it was a great class, but it wasn't on our syllabus. So next week's is going to be short. And then any of you who want to stay, especially you two guys, uh, we're going to do kind of a class lab where we can begin looking at your your uh, perspectives, looking at your mission, vision, and values, so that we can, that's the practical part. We've been teaching this, but if we don't actually help you put it together, uh, my wife will have her computer, you've got yours, we'll take that flash drive, we'll see if we can begin to get something on the screen for you. So we're going to have kind of a lab time, so we are going to, we are going to talk about uh, what's on the syllabus, I don't remember what it is. What it is? Uh, huh? What it is? We don't know what it is. Uh, yeah, I don't have the syllabus. So you want to do my lap lap? <laughs> hey, she's been a guest in our <laughs> class many times. Let me close this in prayer. Okay. Let me close. Thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for your presence tonight. We thank you for uh, just the way you discipled, Lord, the way you led by example, the way you. Uh, taught and illustrated the way you gave practical application lord you are the ultimate disciple maker and lord i pray that you would help us as we plant churches as we lead in our churches i just pray lord that we would be disciple makers in our individual lives but lord also that in our churches that we would have a plan for taking people uh, who don't know you and help them be to become committed followers lord of uh, such a great God. And so, Lord, thank you for this time we've had tonight. Lord, I thank you for all of our pastors in Uganda, for Brother Ed and Brother Alex as they lead. And I just pray, Lord, your blessing over them. And I pray that these uh, classes are helping them as well. Lord, go with everyone tonight as they travel. I just pray your hand of uh, grace and mercy on them, protect them. Uh, and Lord, thank you for the calling you've put on each one of our lives. And may we glorify you in that calling. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.